Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Every year, my family would have a big 4th of July party. My grandparents would come over, my aunts, uncles, cousins, and even some close friends and neighbors. All the kids would line up their fireworks and we'd decide in what order we wanted to shoot everything. The adults always prepared the food and would sit around and talk. It was always a blast. We rarely had issues as in fights, injuries, and such, and I think that had a lot to do with my grandfather. If anyone tried to start an argument, he always knew what to say to get people to calm down and then ease the tension. He was a smart man, and I definitely learned a lot from him over the years. As I got older, and I started going to parties or hosting my own, I always held on to some of his wisdom and advice to make me a better person. One of the things he taught me was to be aware of your surroundings. He was in the Air Force, and he always talked about how important it is to know what's happening around you. And while you shouldn't dwell on the negative, you should always be able to get an idea as to possible outcomes around you and know how to react to them appropriately. This has helped me tremendously in my career of being an aircraft mechanic as you have to be precise in everything you do. Another thing he taught me was, no matter where you live or your age, it's always polite to get to know your neighbors. Again, you never know if you could be the person they need in their life to be a friend or someone they can turn to when they feel that they may be in trouble or need help. So, when my parents moved and I was still young, we made little baskets for everyone on our block as our way of introducing ourselves. These were two things he taught me that are important to this story today. I was thankful that my wife was able to meet my grandfather before his passing, so she knew all about him and his wisdom. So, when we got our first place together, she knew that we would have to introduce ourselves to the block. We moved in early June and decided that we wanted to have a housewarming party and a 4th of July party all in one. Because of this, we agreed that we would let the neighborhood know as well as a warning in case we got too loud or if they wanted to join and get to know each other better. We prepared our gifts that week and over the weekend and we went off to start handing them out. Everything went as I would expect. Some people were happy to meet us. Some were surprised that people still introduced themselves and some even wanted to show my wife her jewelry collection. There were two houses, though, that we did not get an answer, so we left our gift with a card at the door, so they still get the introduction and the invite. One of our neighbors, Kathy, seemed to be the cliché neighbor that knows everything about everyone, so we got the short version of everyone's history from her. I appreciated this, since I wasn't able to meet everyone and I had mentioned this to her. As she explained that one house was someone's winter house and that they wouldn't be back for a few months and the other, she said to give up on trying to meet them. Curious, I asked her about this. She said that it was a middle-aged couple living there and they rarely went outside. She thinks the guy worked overnights as she always saw him coming home late at night and not leaving till evening, while the woman always left midday looking her best and coming home before he left for the night. She tried talking to them on a few occasions, and the guy tended to ignore her, while the woman seemed to rush the conversation and did not want to get too close. She said she gave up trying to get to know them, but she had her door camera, so she always saw them coming and going since they live across from her. I kept this in the back of my mind to process it later. We said our goodbyes, 
finished my going back to the winter house to pick up the gift that we had left and agreed to try again in the winter, being assured by Kathy that she would let us know when they got back. The following morning, as we left to get coffee, I noticed the gift from the mysterious couple's home was gone, so hopefully they got it and at least enjoyed it. The next couple of weeks went by as normal. We unpacked and prepared ourselves for the party. This whole time, never seeing this couple. Kathy was certainly right. It was going to make for a difficult time if we ever wanted to try meeting them. Then came the night of the party. Both of our parents showed up and a few of our siblings. Because some couldn't make it, as well as some old friends and new neighbors. Kathy came over, brought us a cake I believe, but said that since her dog was afraid of fireworks, that she would watch hours from her home so he wasn't alone. A few people had kids with them so we kept it appropriate for the time being. After the kids finished off their fireworks and those families left as well as our parents, we started getting a little more rowdy. There was more drinking, a little more stupidity with fireworks, but everyone was having a good time. And at one point, I was fetching more rounds for everyone, asking who all wanted one, when I noticed a guy that was talking to my wife's friend over towards the side of the patio that I didn't recognize at first. He was wearing dark jeans that appeared to be really muddy and a button-down shirt that was halfway open and a baseball cap. Thinking it was someone her friend brought along, I asked if they wanted anything and made my way to the kitchen to grab the drinks. I gave her friend and the guy their drinks, and they both said thanks, and I carried on passing out the other drinks. As the night went on, I saw the same guy talking to other people, including my wife. He was still carrying around the same bottle that I got him, and when I would ask if he wanted another or if I could take it from him, he always refused, saying that he was still drinking it. I kept an eye on him just because I didn't recognize him and no one had introduced him to me yet. We still enjoyed our night taking pictures and recording our stupid antics until it was time for people to start dispersing. When my wife was seeing her friend off, I noticed the guy wasn't with her, so I went and asked her about him. She said that she had come alone, but the guy was talking to her for quite a bit. She said that she didn't recognize him either and thought that it was one of my friends from work since I was talking to him quite a bit. I let it go, thinking maybe he was someone from work that I didn't know too well, or maybe he came with someone else and I didn't notice. I did drink a lot that night, so I was also not fully there, I'm sure. We cleaned up a bit and then headed to bed, and thankfully, we were off the next day so we could recover. But still, we were never able to determine who our mystery guest was. As I was coming home from work some time that same week, I saw several cop cars at the non-social neighbor's house. Like anyone would, I tried looking to see if I could tell what was going on, but I couldn't see much more than a crime scene tape going across the house. I got home to be greeted with my wife and Kathy in the living room. They told me that they didn't know what was going on yet either, but Kathy was already visiting when the police started showing up. Shortly I got home, Kathy mentioned going back home so she could try to find out more when we actually had someone else knocking on our door. It was another officer wanting to ask us questions about our neighbor and if we had seen him. I explained that I didn't even know what they looked like, but Kathy began describing them more and said that she hadn't seen them in a few days. The officer pulled out a picture to show us and asked if we'd seen him when my wife and I realized that he was the guy 
that was at our party. Kathy and the officer both looked shocked, and the officer began asking us what he was wearing, how long he was there, wanted to know when he got there, and when he left. If he said anything to us or was acting suspicious at all, we tried to answer the best we could about his whereabouts and explain that he was technically invited, but since we never actually met them, we didn't know if they would show up or not. Kathy finally started asking the questions that we were all wondering to find out what was going on when the officer tried being vague but still informed us. He said that they were called there on a welfare check by someone. They had a reason to enter the property where they found a female's body in a tub and the man that lived there was nowhere to be found. Kathy's description confirmed that it was the woman that lived there and we were all in shock. They said that they were looking for him, for questioning and asked us to call if we saw him but to avoid letting him in, as he might be dangerous. So, we were obviously a bit on the edge at this point, not really knowing what to do. We offered to let Kathy and her dog stay in our spare room, so she wasn't alone, but was insistent that she would be okay alone. We walked her back home, and when we returned, we made sure all the windows and doors were locked, to make sure that there was no chance of someone getting in. And thankfully, we also had security cameras that we could watch as well. That day came and went without them finding the guy. The news van started showing up and we were seeing it on TV now. That's when it started getting worse. They said that he was wanted for the murder of his girlfriend, who most likely died on the 4th. And that's when I started thinking. This guy was definitely at my place on the 4th. He wasn't talking about himself much, but made sure to talk to a few people to make it obvious that he was there. I began feeling that we were being used as an alibi. I felt sick. This girl was either dead or dying in a house a few down from ours while we were there covering for him. A murderer. Our families were there, and it was a terrifying thought. And while it was bittersweet as a woman lost her life, they did finally catch the guy. He was trying to flee the country, but only got as far as Texas when they finally caught him. Now, this was coming from Kathy. She said her husband was a cop, so she knew some of the detectives. They told her that the woman's sister hadn't heard from her, and the guy had a record and was worried that something had happened. She was most likely killed that night of the 4th, so that confirmed my suspicion that we were definitely used. I'm glad that they caught the guy, but since this incident, I monitor a hell of a lot better as to who comes over to my place or just who I'm around in general. My grandfather was definitely right. You really can't be too careful. Growing up, me and my brother lived in my grandparents' home with our mother. She had us at a young age, so my parents didn't last long. My grandparents helped raise us while my mother went back and forth between working and trying to live like a teenager with no kids. We could go a few days without seeing her. Our grandparents would get us off to school, feed us, and bathe us, and my mother didn't care much for responsibilities. The less work she had to do, the better, which is why none of her jobs lasted longer than six months, and she was always taking advantage of whatever she could get, like unemployment. I bring this up because it shows how much I respected my grandparents and I looked up to them. When my mom ran off with someone to another state, thinking that they would get married, come back to get us and have this rich life, my grandparents were the ones that paid our school fees, bought us clothes, helped with homework, all of it. 
My grandmother was such a kind and giving person. She taught me everything I needed to know about cooking, fixing, and mending my own clothes, helped me learn how to do my own hair, while my grandfather always tried teaching me and my brother how to be self-sufficient and fix our own things. He acted tough, but he had a soft heart as well, always giving my mom another chance just for her to take advantage of them over and over and over again. This always made for interesting holidays. The house wasn't huge, but it certainly wasn't small either. It was a three-bedroom, but they had a big backyard, so the holidays were usually spent over there. My grandparents would always be in the same spots. Inside, Grandpa would be sitting in his big recliner, and Grandma in her rocking chair that he made for her. Outside, they had two rocking lawn chairs that they always sat in while everyone else had to decide where they wanted to be. It was a perfect view of the whole yard so they could see everyone coming and going. And on the 4th of July, it was a perfect view of the fireworks going straight up. My grandmother loved the fountains. She didn't care much for the huge mortars that went in the sky, but the little ones that always had a story to them and different colors that she loved. As we grew up, my mom continued being the same person that she was, so she became more of a distant relative. However, when my grandfather passed away a few years after I graduated high school, she was around more often, trying to care for my grandmother. I ended up getting an apartment nearby to help out as well. And when I would come over, we would begin to hear weird sounds or have weird events occur. And my grandmother always says that it was grandpa watching over us. I used to just shrug it off, thinking that it was just something people said to help cope with the loss. I'm sure feeling like someone is close to you that you've lost can somewhat ease the pain. But I began to believe it more when I would personally experience things. My nickname that my grandpa gave me was Buttons because I started collecting them. I have bought many clothing items, purses, and bags just because I like the way they look and I would cut out the button and use the item for something else. My grandfather worked at a junkyard and if he ever found any, he'd always bring them home for me too. So when I started finding buttons that I'd never seen before in places that they shouldn't be, I really felt like it was him giving them to me as gifts. I became a little more open to the possibility from then on. So continuing with tradition, we would always keep Grandpa's seat open for the 4th of July so he could still be there with my grandma. Over the years, I ended up getting married and my husband moved in with me. My mom also started losing interest in helping my grandma. She would begin disappearing for days again, so I would have to go over there to make sure that she had enough food and toiletries and just to make sure that she was okay. My brother also moved out of state, so there was little that he could do to help. I'm thankful my husband was always understanding when I would have to go over there after work or when he was willing to help me to get groceries for her. Well, sadly, my grandmother passed away too due to heart complications and once again, that meant my mother would be back around. She wanted to help as much as possible with the funeral arrangements and she spent time with me and my husband too and actually seemed like a normal person for once. However, I would learn that it was more so to find out about her will. My grandpa of course left everything to my grandmother if she survived, so now she gets to actually get something out of them. It turns out they actually left her their house, but most of the money they had saved, they gave it to me and my brother. I could tell that this angered my mom because she wanted the opposite. She threw many hints at us about it too, but 
we always ignored it or changed the subject. She actually moved into the house and we stopped talking to her for the most part and we went about our lives. I ended up putting the money I got into savings to hold on to it as we were planning on getting our own home and starting a family. To speed this along, it was less than two years since my grandmother's passing for my mom to destroy that home. I went over there a few times and she had tried to sell almost everything she could in that house. She tried selling their lawn chairs and I actually paid her for them and begged her to keep them there until I had a place. Since she started running out of money and she couldn't pay for the repairs, she was actually trying to find someone to sell it to. She tried letting her friends live there, but quickly learned that much like her, they didn't want to pay rent. I couldn't stand to see this house go to someone else or take any more damage, so after talking to my husband, we agreed to try and buy it from my mom. After many discussions and her asking for ridiculous amounts, she finally agreed to let us have it. We made very strict rules about her not being able to show up uninvited and the locks would be changed to prevent this too and she agreed. Of course, saying one thing and following through are two different things. Throughout the next year or so, we made the necessary repairs and moved in. But I noticed that unlike my grandfather was in the past, there seemed to be no presence of either of them. I would notice this on those bad days where I just wish that they were still around to see everything that I have achieved. This made it even harder when I was pregnant and I had my first child. I wanted them to be able to meet her and show her that kind of grandparent love that I got. Before I continue, I will say that shortly before my daughter was born, I cut all ties with my mother. We found out that she was involved in some really shady and dangerous things as well as people. She brought someone to my baby shower uninvited and they tried doing coke in my bathroom. I told them to leave before I called the cops and to never come back. She has never met my daughter and tries calling to see her in between asking for money so I blocked her number and tried to move on without her in my life. My daughter was born healthy and happy in April, other than, other than my husband's birthday in June, the next big holiday coming up was going to be 4th of July. So, we wanted to have a small party with a few friends. As we started setting up the yard, I remember the lawn chairs, and I dug around the shed to find them. They weren't taken care of like I would have liked, but they were still there. So I cleaned them up and I put them right back where they belonged. When we went and got our fireworks, I saw a huge fountain called the Beautiful Rose. My grandmother's name was Rose and I just knew that she would love it, so I happily bought it home with me. The party was going great as expected. At one point, I went and laid my daughter down to sleep. I turned on her monitor and clipped the other one onto my shirt, so I could hear if she woke up. And while we were outside, a friend asked about the lawn chairs and I explained their history. When I went over to move a plate that was sitting in one of the chairs, I noticed something under it. It was a button with the name Chloe on it. It was my daughter's name. It was odd that it was under the chair, and after a quick thought, I knew that it was my grandfather, which really made me ecstatic. As the night progressed though, I started having more events like this occur. It may sound weird to some, but I would find the letter C just everywhere. When we would move the dead fireworks, I would pick up the shredded pieces of paper, I would throw the plates away, and the sauce on it would make a letter. I mentioned it in passing to my friend who was there who was very spiritual and she said that it may be a sign from someone else. At first I chuckled at the idea, then became curious, so I went and grabbed the piece I just recently threw away 
and the plate, to my surprise, it actually spelled out Chloe again. I thought it was crazy, but then my friend asked if she was okay. I thought it was weird at first because she knew she was fine. Until she said it may be their way of getting my attention. So we went to her room and as I opened the door, to my horror, Chloe was not in her bed. The window was open and the monitor had been turned off. My friend ran off to get my husband as I ran to the window. Her room faced the front of the house and we were all at the back, so we didn't notice. And as I ran out the front door, I noticed someone sitting under her window. As I approached the person, preparing to knock them out, I realized that it was my mother rocking my daughter back and forth. I grabbed her from her as I noticed that she was obviously on something. She was twitching a lot and trying to talk but couldn't, hardly making a sentence or stand up on her own. I started screaming at her and all she could say was, Sorry, and choking. I started looking at Chloe when I noticed she wasn't hardly moving. I brought her inside and I noticed that she was turning purple. By the time the police and ambulance showed up, we found out that she came over wanting to meet Chloe, high on something. She had a bottle of apple juice that she was trying to feed to her, and she nearly made her choke and drown. Thankfully, Chloe was okay. My mom was taken to jail since she had stuff on her too, and we decided not to press charges but we did get a restraining order. We haven't heard from her in quite some time, but my brother still talks to her. He claims that she's cleaned up and doing better, but I'm still not sure that I'm ready to see her. If I had waited much longer to check on her, she could have had brain damage. To this day, I am certain that it was my grandparents trying to get my attention. From the button letting me know that they were there, and all the letters trying their hardest to warn me. I am definitely more accepting of the paranormal experiences now, and I do think that they are still helping me raise her, even if they're not physically there. I live in a cozy little home with my son and husband. Since our home is on the smaller side, we usually go to other people's homes for holidays or parties. One past year, we wanted to do something for just our family, so we decided that we would go camping for the 4th of July weekend. Our county also doesn't allow fireworks, so we thought that we would find a place in the next state over and have a different view see a fireworks show, and maybe light off a few of our own. Our son had never been camping before either, so it would be an exciting first time and he was really looking forward to it. We went and bought a tent, sleeping bags, and other camping essentials to start preparing. We started going over safety tips as well, such as making sure that we had plenty of first aid stuff, some bug spray, sunscreen, and aloe. Some things, though, are a little harder to prepare for. The time came to head out to the campgrounds. The 4th was on a Friday, so we decided to go on Thursday. That way, we could get there, a look around the area, to decide what we wanted to do. Then after, we can just enjoy the 4th. We could spend time doing whatever we wanted for the rest of the weekend. When we got there, we found our lot that was right by four other tents. One was a middle-aged couple that was there with their dog, and two tents were for a family of five, the parents, two kids around nine or ten, and also a toddler. And the last one reminded me of ourselves, a couple with a little boy. As we started setting up, all the kids around were ready to play, going over to each person's tent and asking the kids' ages and names and if they wanted to go play by the water. He was my firstborn, so I was quite protective of him. 
and I didn't want him playing by the lake without us. So, I agreed to let him play on the small playground equipment that was right next to our area. I could see him from there, so I was okay with it. And the four kids were playing and talking about whatever kids talk about, and the parents of the single boy, I'll call him Kyle, came over and introduced themselves. They said that this was their second attempt at camping. They tried last summer, but they were forced to evacuate after someone caught part of the campgrounds on fire. They said it was most likely caused by a fire pit that wasn't allowed that got out of control. They said it was fairly close to them because they could see the flames and they had to pack up in a rush, which scared Kyle. From what they explained, the poor kid was pretty scared for a while to do anything close to fires or anything camping related. They mentioned how they eased them into it though, by camping in their backyard, which made me think we should have tried that first to see how our kid would react. But overall though, they wanted to say thanks and for letting Kyle play with our son, Nathan and then complimented on how well-mannered he was and being willing to pull Kyle in with the other kids. It was a very proud parent moment for myself. That night, and the fourth itself were both great, since everyone was so kind and welcoming, we had a cookout together and we put all of our food into it. The kids were having a blast and we gave some of our little firework stuff like smoke bombs to the larger family since they didn't have any, which kept them occupied. I will say, those older two were a little more on the daredevil side. They were trying to throw smoke bombs in the air and catch them, hold them in their mouths, tried to throw rocks from the gravel road at the birds, things like that. And thankfully, Kyle and Nathan stepped back from those activities. Saturday, we decided to have a little more time relaxing. After sleeping in a bit and having breakfast, we decided to go for a little walk through the trees. My father-in-law always took my husband fishing and hunting and was always big on the outdoors, so he knew trees and wildlife and loved teaching Nathan just the same. To our surprise, Kyle was just as interested and asked to join us, I don't think I would have been too comfortable with it, but then his parents asked to join too. They said that they would show us where the fire was, and then we could go to a more secluded part of the lake where there were less people in it. We're not familiar with this campsite, so we agreed and thought that at least we would have some peaceful time away from the other rowdy kids. So, we put on our swimsuits under our clothes, we grabbed the things we wanted to take, and then we headed off. The fire occurred on the other side of the grounds. There were several trees that were still standing, but obviously had dead from the fire. There was a patch of what appeared to be dead grass, where they attempted to regrow it, but it wasn't doing very good. They had posted a sign as a reminder that fires weren't allowed outside of their permitted pits or grills too. The area was empty of people too. It appeared to be open, but no one was staying there. It definitely didn't look pretty, so I'm sure that was why. From there, we decided to go swimming since it was empty. We hung out in the water, we all talked and the boys were having a lot of fun by themselves. I think they wanted that more, to be able to do something a little more innocent on their own. I felt comfortable enough that they wouldn't get into trouble, and with no one else around, I could loosen up more. At one point, the boys started gathering fallen branches, mud and rocks to make a cave for the rabbit that they saw. I wasn't going to be the one to tell them that they live in holes, because they were having so much fun, so I just let them go. They started talking about being short on supplies and my husband had mentioned one of the trees that were burnt that would have softer and easier branches to break, so off they went to start collecting. 
They did this once and came back pretty quickly. The second time they left to gather more, I didn't see them come back for a few minutes, so I hollered for them. And when they didn't respond or come back, I got a little suspicious and I decided to head over to see what was going on. And as I walked over the small hill, I noticed them quickly shuffling around dirt like they were trying to find something or bury something. I then asked them what they were up to, thinking that they were just playing some game, but they were both acting standoffish and quiet. I asked if there was something wrong and Kyle responded no and that he wasn't feeling good anymore. So I started to approach them to figure out the change in tones when Nathan said that they found something bad. Thinking they were playing with something they found like a lighter, I approached them smiling, saying that it would be alright whatever it is. When Kyle started crying, Nathan pointed to a pile and started talking fast about how they were just trying to get dirt. I was trying to calm down two boys while also looking over to see what they found when my stomach dropped. There were bones in the dirt. It was a hand with part of an arm sticking out from the ground. I just stared at it for a minute, not knowing how to react. I finally grabbed both of the boys by the arm and I started rushing them away while shouting for my husband. They all started running over towards me and I guess my tone sounded alarming too. I explained to them what I saw and the guys went to look. My husband agreed to stay nearby just in case and the rest of us hurried over to the campsite nearby to ask someone to call a park ranger. From there it became a blur. The rangers came out and they looked and they had to call the police and tape everything off. We were obviously on edge. After being interviewed by the police and the poor boys being questioned, we were finally cleared to go back to our campsite. At this point, we were ready to go. This definitely wasn't going away, so we decided to just leave. We spoke to law enforcement, gave them our contact info, as well as Kyle's family, because they still seem like a great little family, and then we left. Later on, Keith and Marissa, Kyle's parents, contacted us and told us that they identified the body as a little girl that had gone missing about a year back. It was then assumed that the fire was likely used to cover up the murder, though the body wasn't found at that time. It was hard to have that conversation with Nathan to explain that there are some evil people out there and that's why we are so picky about who he's with, where he goes, and that we want to make sure that we know where he is. He was too young to have witnessed something like that. It was a terrifying thing to witness, and I don't even know if they ever found the person who did it. But I hope that no one I know ever has to witness or go through something like that. This happened a few years ago when a friend and I shared a duplex. These were owned by individual people instead of a company, so there were less people around and less staff to monitor us and we were pretty much left to ourselves. There were a few other surrounding duplexes to our sides and real nice looking houses across from us. Some of the duplexes looked okay like ours and some of the others weren't as nice and taken care of. The same went with some of the tenants. Some of them were good people, some kept to themselves, and some you tried to avoid eye contact. Thankfully, our neighbor of the attached duplex was one of the good ones. Well, at least half of them. It was an older woman, Ruby, that lived there. When we first moved in, she seemed very spry and outdoorsy too. That's part of the reason why Jess got so involved in gardening. She was always outside, planting, watering, and weeding her garden bed. 
cleaning her patio furniture and etc. She'd make too many sweets or snacks and always bring us extras and things like that. We didn't mind at all, and otherwise, she kept to herself and we kept to ours. There was no snooping around, asking questions, and getting in each other's business either, so she was pretty much the perfect neighbor. However, Ruby had a son, Marco, that was less than welcoming and we didn't care to see him around. He would randomly show up and when she wasn't home, he could just be standing outside for hours until she showed up. The first time we saw him, he was sitting on her steps in a hoodie and jeans, falling asleep. We didn't have a security camera set up, so after about an hour of him sitting there, I almost went to ask him who he was waiting for when I noticed Ruby pull in. I watched through the window just to make sure because I didn't want her to be harassed or something worse if this person was a stranger. And I saw the smile on her face fade to more of a fake grin when she saw him sitting there and they started talking. She then let him in. And from there, I assumed that she knew who the person was and I let it go. Marco would randomly show up at times and could be there for a few hours and then someone would come pick him up or it would appear like he would stay there overnight a few times. We were finally introduced one time when we were out front smoking and he asked for a cigarette. Ruby came out shortly after and told us that he was her son and he was visiting for a while. We were polite but the guy definitely didn't seem like he was all there. He typically looked exhausted all the time. It started to become a normal thing when he was around, and as soon as we were outside, he was asking us for a smoke, and he was over there maybe once a week. Then, for a while, it became less frequent. Maybe a few days a month. But then after not seeing him for two or three months, he showed back up again, sitting on a porch with a backpack and a box. It would turn out that he would move in with Ruby. <sighs> Great, she didn't look too thrilled about it either. As I started to hear them talk outside on the back patio, she would ask him about his plans, and he would get irritated and say things like he didn't know, that he didn't have any, and don't worry about me and etc., one time late at night, after he bummed another smoke from us, he asked where he could go to get cheap beer without being carded. We told him that we didn't really know and just told him about a local liquor store. He then proceeded to walk off down the street and as we finished our cigarette, Ruby came out and apologized for her son. She said that he had been down on his luck that she was trying to get him back on his feet and also appreciated us for being patient with him around. She tried to offer us money for the cigarettes he kept taking, but we always refused. Sadly, they would begin arguing more. You could hear them fighting outside, and then you could hear them fighting inside. You could hear the door slamming as he left and him banging on the door to be let back in when he forgot his key. Ruby had already started to shut herself in more. We hardly saw her go outside anymore. I'd notice on the camera that she'd go out real early in the morning in her robe to water her plants, but then she would quickly go back in. I think she had like a book club or a Bible club every Wednesday night, and a few other ladies would be over at her place, and, well, that stopped too. I felt really bad, but there wasn't really anything we could do, but just hope that he would leave soon. Well, that would soon come to fruition when he gets kicked out. They were arguing again, and after someone else equally shady showed up at her place, Marco went outside and brazenly, with a camera right on them, made a drug deal. I now understood why Ruby had been so upset. 
I can't imagine it was for her or that she used it at all. I shamefully went out back to listen to the fight when I heard it and she mentioned that he was there for a new start, to kick it and get his own place. She complained that he was using again and that he hadn't found a job or even had proof that he was looking. She said that she didn't want that stuff around her, in her place, and didn't want his friends to know where she lived, so she told him to leave. I know we, for one, were thankful. He slammed the front door and started walking down the street again. I kept checking the cameras a few times to see if he would ever return, but he never did, and wouldn't the next night either. However, it wouldn't be a simple move out by any means. I am a heavy sleeper, so a few hours into my slumber, I am awoken to just banging on my door, and as I went to open it, I noticed the smell of smoke that was the reason for her waking me up too. We started looking around, making sure nothing was on fire and trying to find out where the smoke was coming from when we started hearing smoke alarms going off from Ruby's side. We quickly grabbed our phones and ran outside. Jess started calling 911 and I just remember frantically beating on her door to try and wake her up, but she never answered. This is where I regretted never swapping phone numbers with her. When the fire truck showed up, we told them that we thought Ruby was still inside and went to the end of our driveway to wait to see what happened. Unfortunately, Ruby was still inside, but they were able to get her out, barely alive. Not only was she in there, but she didn't answer because she had been beaten on the back of her head causing her to pass out on the living room floor. Of course, the fire was intentionally set as well, and we had a feeling that we knew by who. Thankfully, we didn't have to point the finger as we learned Ruby identified Marco as the one that did it. Jess ended up helping her out a lot when she was at the hospital and told her what had happened. She locked Marco out, so he ended up breaking in through the back door. They had gotten into a fight when he hit her in the back of the head, and the next thing she knew, she was at the hospital. But don't worry, she talked to him when he got arrested, and he admitted that he was high when this took place, but thought only his mom's side would burn down and was sorry for hurting us. Charmer, right? She had damage in the living room and they had to repair the wall separating our units, so we both got put in a hotel for a while. Jess still keeps in touch with Ruby and tells me how she's doing, but I don't care for attached units anymore and I moved into my own place as soon as I could. I have worked at a locally owned liquor store for quite a while now. In fact, I'm almost at a decade working there. I started back when I was 21 and I'm about to be 30. If there is something I can tell you about working at a liquor store, they are crazy people magnets and those crazy people like to come out at night. And when they come out, they crave alcohol and the only thing standing between them and what they want is at that point, me. So that said, I could probably fill out an entire novel with the weird people that I've encountered and the crazy situations that I've been in. However, just for the sake of brevity, I'll just talk about one customer in particular. He was a decent guy, there was just one instance that genuinely freaked me out. A bit of a backstory to how he came to be a customer. About two years ago into my working there, the store actually changed its hours to be open later because the state or county, not sure which one, had approved extended hours for liquor stores. Because of this, we went from closing at 9pm to closing at midnight. I was cool with working the late shifts, 
so I got put on the closing, and for the most part, everything was okay. That was until the new hours attracted a very particular man. We are going to call this man Daryl. Daryl was a very strange guy that was very, very open about the things in his life to people that he barely knew. The first night that he came in, he grabbed a large handle off the shelf, came up to the register, and looked me dead in the eyes. And when I said dead in the eyes, I meant that he seriously looked dead and he stared at me with a seriously cold and aggressive glare. I was taught from a young age that you should be nice to people you don't know because you never know what they're going through. So I looked him back and asked how he was doing on that fine evening. As soon as I said that, he said back in practically a whisper, Don't talk. After about 10 or 20 agonizingly silent and awkward seconds, he smiled and said something to the effect of, All right, you're pure. And at first, I thought this don't talk statement was the start of a robbery, like he was about to pull a gun or something. But then he gave me his half-toothless grin and kind of put my mind at ease. I rang him up and we moved on. Then the next time he came in, I asked him about the whole your pure thing was about. He smiled at me and said that he had a gift that he stared into your eyes long enough he could tell if you were a good person or not. I jokingly asked him what he would have done if his gift had told him that I wasn't a good person. And he said, Oh, well, I would probably would have killed you. And this may sound like something that would be said by someone that's making a joke or something to that effect, but the tone he had sent chills down my spine. I could tell that this man was not joking. He shrugged and then followed up with, But we don't have to worry about that because you're pure. I can tell you won't be a problem for me. After this night, he came in several times over a few months, and for the most part of the conversations were normal. Well, as normal as they could be with him. He would talk about his job as a janitor, though he wouldn't tell me where he worked and said that it was top secret. He told me about his friends, that he went to Iraq with them, and he would tell me about the ones that didn't make it back. Every once in a while, the short conversations would be broken by him making a really hard grimace and then looking away, which told me that he had some internal issues that he was facing. Because of this, I was always polite to him and I made it to a point to keep the conversations as light as I could. But there was one night where he came into the store in his underwear and paid in cash. You can guess where he was keeping it. Honestly, that was the night that I almost checked out of this whole thing. But he was incredibly apologetic and he told me that he forgot his pants. And that's it. He had apparently simply forgotten to put his pants on. Like I said, it was weird, but I let it go and we moved forward. The aforementioned event that this story is actually about took place around six months into Daryl being a regular, almost every other day kind of customer. He and I had built quite the rapport. Hell, after the underwear thing, I would say that we were almost even friends. He had told me all about this time in the military. He had mentioned a few crazy things that he was researching and he had even told me that he had a son somewhere out there that he hadn't seen for nearly a decade. One night in the fall, probably some time around October or November, he came into the store and he had a look about him that I hadn't seen before. When I noticed that he seemed off, I said, Hey, Daryl, you okay, buddy? 
you're not looking too good. And as soon as I asked him this, his face turned beet red and he grabbed one of the bottles off the shelf and chucked it straight at me. It hit the shelf and shattered, knocking several things down in the process. At that moment, I was seriously confused and scared. This guy had always seemed a bit out there, but this level of violence wasn't like him. I was standing in the corner, petrified, and trying to process what exactly was happening. And Daryl was standing near the shelf, smashing bottle after bottle, and screaming about something that honestly made no sense. He was screaming about how everything in his life was going to hell, about how everyone that he knew was out to kill him. He started listing off what I'm assuming were events of things going wrong in his life. Then, he started screaming at me and asking if I was in on it. He was adamant that someone out there was trying to quote-unquote ruin everything in his life that he had worked so hard for. So at this point, it's 11 at night in this small town. I'm standing behind the counter with my back against the wall and my shoes covered in liquor and shards of glass. There were no other customers in the store and there were no other employees there to help me as I was the only closer. All the while, this guy that I was sort of acquainted with from his times buying alcohol at our store was shouting every kind of violent profanity at me. And he was starting to convince himself that, for some reason, I was one of the bad guys out to get him. He starts in on how the government was trying to find him, and that the only person he talks to is me, so the fact that they found him meant that I was the one telling them information. Obviously, I had no clue what the hell was going on about, but I was scared, and I wasn't sure how far he was going to take it. Thankfully though, while I was paralyzed, the owner of the neighboring gas station had apparently called the police. I guess he heard the screaming and the glass shattering, because after about five minutes of enduring the insanity that was unraveling before me, I heard the door opening and the sound of an officer screaming, Get on the ground! And Daryl actually started to turn his anger toward them for a moment. But I think the weight of the situation may have dawned on him, or maybe he came back to reality, because he just started sobbing and quickly got on the ground. After the insanity finally came to an end, the owner of the store showed up and asked me, alongside the police, what had happened. I told him that I didn't know. I told him everything I knew about Daryl, and that he just showed up enraged and started trashing the store. I felt bad, honestly. It was midnight, and this poor guy had clearly had an episode. But after all was said and done, I found out that Daryl actually did have a few mental issues, and he was apparently off his meds for a while. On top of that, he wasn't supposed to be drinking while taking his medication, so it was a recipe for something to go wrong. And like I said though, he was fairly normal for most of our interactions, but this one night, he had apparently snapped and I had just said the wrong thing to him. My manager and I talked about the situation and he decided not to press charges against Daryl, so as long as he could pay for what he destroyed. I actually pitched then half for it, I think it was something like $150. And sadly, Daryl only came in one more time and he actually did so to apologize to me personally. He said that he had issues and that he didn't mean to scare me. I told him that I understood, I shook his hand, and that was the last time he and I ever interacted. I personally just hope that he's doing alright. I have family members that live in the middle of nowhere, way outside of any major town or anything. 
and of course, they are the family that I tend to go see during the holidays. Thanksgiving is one of the major holidays for my family, as it was my grandmother's favorite day, and we get all the extended family on her side together to have a lovely meal, and it's always been a good time. This story isn't about the get-together, though. It's about something that happened after the fact. Most years, I would stay at my aunt's house and leave early the next morning. But on the year that this happened, I was working for a company that was doing a merger with another organization, so they pretty much had shut off all time off requests, only the specific holidays. And because of this, I had to get home that night so that I could get up at 6am and get to the office early the next day. If nothing else, it was a pain in my ass, as I hate driving late at night, especially for the full hour that I have to drive to the north to get home, and the fact that they live out in the middle of nowhere means that there are literally no streetlights. I tried to leave at a good time, but it was hard to leave my family that night as they wanted to continue talking and spending time together. So, by the time I got out of there, it was around 10.30 at night. I get out of the driveway and out onto the really dark roads, trying to keep my eyes open and my mind focused on the trip. I was definitely struggling. Like, really struggling. To keep myself awake. I think that digesting all that food and the hard spike in my blood sugar had really started to take its toll on me. I could feel my eyelids starting to drop as I was going. The longer I went, the harder it was to keep myself going, so I figured that the best course of action for me was to put on some music. Unfortunately, I do have an older car that doesn't have any sort of wireless connectivity, so when I listen to music, it has to be on a CD. The disc that I had in was not going to be enough to keep me awake. I needed something heavy and aggressive. So, I ejected the CD and slowed down a bit so that I could reach down onto my floor to grab my CD folder, which is something that I will say was incredibly stupid. I was taking my eyes off the road and focusing on reaching down to grab my CD holder. Like I said, stupid. But it's what I did. I reached down, grabbed my folder, and grabbed the disc for some metal band, and when I looked back up at the road, I noticed a figure standing there in the middle of the road. I panicked, and I slammed my brakes to do my best to avoid hitting whatever or whoever this was. Thankfully, despite the car being old, it did have a good braking system, and I was able to stop pretty quickly without flipping my car or driving into the trees in the shoulder. When I came to the screeching halt, I was gripping the wheel and just trying to breathe through my excruciatingly painful heartbeat that was pulsing in my head. I honestly thought that I was about to have a heart attack, considering how high my blood pressure was over those couple of seconds. After a few moments of taking deep breaths and just staring at my dashboard, I finally was able to get my mind back to reality and then realized that I needed to make sure that I actually didn't hit whatever that was. I looked up and out all of the windows, and in the mirrors, trying to see if I could see anything. But there was nothing there. I was confused, panicked, and trying to not literally pass out. Where the hell had this thing gone? And what the hell was it? I pulled the car over to the side of the road and parked it so that I could get out and look around to see what was going on. I stepped out onto the road and walked a bit back, looking out into the shadows of the road that was lit only by my taillights. I stared at the darkness, squinted, trying to see if there was anything there, when I did finally see something. In the darkness, I could see what looked to be that same figure still mostly shapeless, but almost human-shaped, just standing in the darkness and looking in my direction. I lifted my hand and waved and shouted back to see if this was a person, and if they were okay. I shouted, Hey, 
Is everything all right? And as I did, this figure just stood there completely motionless. I was starting to get freaked out thinking that this wasn't a person, that it was something else, something supernatural. I started to walk backwards toward my car, keeping my eyes on this figure, and as I got to my car and reached toward the handle, I heard what sounded like laughing. Like a high-pitched giggling voice in the distance, out in the direction of whatever that thing was. That was all that I needed to hear. I threw my door open, jumped in, and I took back off down the road to continue my trip. I drove the rest of the way in silence, my heart keeping up its stupid fast rate, I'm staring in my rearview mirror every ten seconds to see if this thing was following me somehow. Obviously it wasn't. Whatever the hell that demonic thing was, it stayed there in the dark. A fact for which I was very thankful. I got home and I struggled to go to sleep that night just kind of staring at the ceiling with my heart pounding like hell. Honestly, I don't think my BPM dropped below 120 until the next morning. Like, my body was reacting intensely to this whole thing. Like, my instincts knew that whatever this was, was truly dangerous. And it would have been much worse had I not taken off. To this day, I still can't explain what happened on that drive home. I've tried to rationalize it as my imagination, just running wild or some sort of prank, but deep down, I know that something truly terrifying was watching me. I've since avoided that stretch of road, I actually found another way to get home from my aunt's house, and the memory of that night haunts me. For anyone that has any sort of name for this thing, or a better explanation, please do let me know. I really can't physically describe it, other than it seemed to just be a living shadow on the road that stared intently. It looked like a person, sort of, but it was mostly shapeless beyond that. It was just intensely dark and creepy. I know that this doesn't help much, but it's the best that I've got for it. Anyways, that's my story. And I hope that I never experience anything like this for the rest of my days. I was recently having a conversation with my mom about some things from my childhood. And during this conversation, she asked me if I remember the time that I was obsessed with aliens. Oh, when she mentioned it, at first, I couldn't really remember any of it at all. But then, after she started talking me through the things that I used to say, do, and the games that I would play with myself and my toys, it slowly started to trickle back into my memory. This was around when I was six at the oldest. At some point during that year, I started telling my mom that I was no longer a person and that I was one of them. I would refuse to elaborate on what or who that them was, but soon after I told her this, I started asking her questions about space. I would ask her random questions about what existed in space, as if I expected her to know, and when she would tell me what she thought, I would just tell her that she was wrong, but then would refuse to elaborate. Not long after that, I started showing a major interest in anything that was space-related or alien-related when it came to toys. I would ask her for a toy rocket ship, spaceships, and I even asked her to paint my ceiling black and put stars on it so it looked like the night sky. I'll give her credit on that one. She actually did paint it black and then put those little glow-in-the-dark stars and planets on it. I remember that my ceiling looked like that when I was young, but I didn't recall that I asked for it to be like that. I thought it was just a cool thing that they had done for me when I was a kid. She said that I would play with my action figures, and every time that I would play with them, 
there would always be some sort of planned space adventure for them to go on. They would always be saying goodbye to their friends because they knew that they wouldn't be coming back and would always load into their ships and would fly off into space. There were even times where the captain of the ships would give speeches to the rest of them, talking about how important these trips were for the future of the world. Of course, with all this, my mom would always call me her little astronaut, and I would tell her that I couldn't be an astronaut. She asked me why and I told her that I wasn't allowed to go back to space unless they came and got me again. And no elaboration in who they were or why I wasn't allowed back in space. Of course, all of this sounds like a fun and kind of cute thing that a child would come up with. But after she told me about all of this, the reason why I had this sudden interest in this came back to me. I believe I was abducted when I was a child, and I remember a significant portion of all of that happened. That night, I recall that I was lying in bed, trying to sleep, but I couldn't. Now, I was six, so I had no real understanding of insomnia or reasons as to why I wouldn't be able to sleep. I just remember that I would close my eyes and feel like I needed to open them. At one point, I got out of the bed and I remember feeling like I needed to look outside, out into the backyard. I walked over to my window and I moved the curtain to look out back. And I remember getting hit with the weirdest feeling. To explain it would be difficult, but I'll say that it felt like the time around me became a solid object, like everything had slowed down to a stop. But it wasn't as if it had just slowed down. It felt like it was being held down by something that was pliable, like an actual force. I know, it sounds really weird, but it's the only way that I could think to truly explain it. I was also affected by this weird force and I couldn't move, breathe, blink, or even really think. All I could do was stare out into the yard, and my brain struggled to process what I saw. I know that there was a weird shadow that was moving toward me, and a bright light that was above the yard. And while it was bright, it was more like it was glowing than shining. It wasn't lighting up the entire yard, but it was emanating a very bright and discernible light. I just stood there, staring at it, for an indiscernible amount of time, but nothing moved. I really don't know how long I stood there, staring at the light, but by the time everything came to an end, I just remember blinking and standing in the hallway of my house. For however long I was standing in my bedroom, staring outside at this light and this moving shadow thing, then, the next moment, I'm in the hallway of my house, nowhere near my bedroom. I ended up confused and terrified, and I didn't know what to do. So I ended up going to the living room and crying myself to sleep. I remember that much. A lot of the time after that is a bit of a blur. But my mom told me that this is when my obsession with aliens all started. I am fully convinced that I was abducted, and I have to assume this was some kind of alien abduction, obviously. But thinking back on it, the fact that I cannot remember anything between seeing the light and waking up in the hallway tells me that they may have done something so that I cannot remember what happened while I was with them. They clearly told me things based on what I told her, like the fact that I couldn't go back to space, but I genuinely cannot remember anything past that. Obviously, I have nothing in ways of evidence to back any of this up beyond my own memories. But I know what happened, and now that I remember it all, I cannot stop thinking about it. I know that a lot of people will disregard the story as they do, but that's okay. They don't have to believe what I went through, so as long as I remember it. I am curious to see 
If any of you listeners have any stories like this, and while I want to be anonymous, I will be reading the comments when you use this story to see if anyone has a similar experience. Thank you for reading. Much love and God bless. This is something that I have never really told anyone about, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately, so here it is. A few years back, around 2015 to 2016, when I was around 18 to 19, I used to work at this little cafe inside of a car parts factory. It was basically a full out but compact restaurant kitchen and a lunchroom for the workers to eat there. Well, this one day, I got a call from my best friend slash co-worker, and she's all kinds of upset because of this creepy new temp worker that made her feel severely uncomfortable by asking her a bunch of personal questions, like what she drove, where she lived, if she was single, if she had any kids, and when she got off of work. She didn't want to walk out to her car alone, and mind you, she was my age too. She was 18 to 19, and this dude was mid to late 30s, if not already in his early 40s, and we're in Flint, Michigan, so we weren't about to take any chances. I drive up to the parking lot, I find her car, parked next to it, and she has a security guard escort her out. We didn't see the guy then, but she described him to me and the guard, and that was that for a few days. Someone found him and told him to stay away from her, and he did. But then he met me. I knew exactly who he was as soon as he stepped up to the register to place his lunch order. Just from the description that I had been given, and by the creepy vibes that he was giving off. He pulled the same intense Q&A on me that he had done to my friend too, but instead of telling him to piss off, or maybe calling security or anything like that, I just told him a bunch of straight up lies. I told him that I drove a blue 2012 Honda Civic, which I knew for a fact was one of the second shift manager's vehicles who always parked near the front of the building. And so I knew that it was going to be there until second shift ended at around 11 p.m. I also told him that my shift ended at around 9.30, which was really the time that I usually slipped out for a cigarette break. So when 9.30 hit later that night, I walk outside to smoke my cigarette and I saw exactly what I was expecting to see. The stupid creep in the parking lot, close to the area that the Honda Civic was sitting. He was just pacing back and forth between two vehicles that were parked a few spaces down in the same row. He was playing on his phone the entire time. At one point, he glanced up and saw me staring at him, but I had my big leather winter coat and a hat on, so I don't really know if he recognized me at first from a distance or not. I finished my smoke and I went back inside and I then explained the entire situation to the security guards, one of which was the original guard that had escorted my friend out to her car a couple of days before. And they were dying laughing at the fact that I had pulled one over on the prick and had actually caught him being shady. I'm not sure what exactly they did about it because I went back to work after that but I do know that they immediately went out and confronted him in the parking lot, and that guy was fired the same week. To this day, I still don't know what his intentions were, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that it couldn't have been anything good. So, ultimately, the moral of the story is always have your friends back and trust your instincts, because if you don't, you could end up cornered in a parking lot 
and possibly attacked or abducted by some creepy guy who asked one too many questions. I originally shared this last night, but I deleted it on accident while trying to delete a different post. I ended up removing some specific details from the story this time around, so if you happen to catch it last night, then you got the uncensored version. I used to live in a three-story house with my parents, my younger sibling, and our dog. We moved into this house a few months before my younger sibling was born. And that was when we first met the neighbors across the street. Lucas, who was the oldest child in their family, was always a bit strange. But there were some aspects of his personality that were more than just strange. They were straight up disturbing. It would take hours to cover everything, so I'm just going to get straight to the point. I'm almost positive that Lucas has been inside of our house in the middle of the night. Our house was built on a hill, so it looked like it was only two stories from the front and the basement was connected to the backyard. The yards in this neighborhood were much larger than they were in newer housing developments, so it would have been very easy for someone to enter our backyard unnoticed. Despite this, my family was terrible at making sure that all the basement doors were locked my younger sibling and I would always go in and out when we were playing in the backyard, or someone would go down to let the dog out, and we would end up forgetting to lock one of the doors before bed. We also lived in a safe area, where it was common for people to leave their doors unlocked. However, my family did always lock the door leading down to the basement every night, along with all of the other doors on the main level of the house. I had a messed up sleep schedule back then, so I would usually still be awake at 3 or 4 in the morning. There were two specific instances that happened very late at night, which make me think that Lucas has been inside of our house without our knowledge. One night, I was in my bedroom on the upper level of the house. It was probably around 2.30 in the morning when I suddenly heard the sound of an angry growl coming from downstairs. Thinking that my dog had spotted a cat in the front yard, I quickly rushed downstairs to stop him from barking and waking up my entire family. This kind of thing would happen every now and then, so I wasn't thinking too much of it at that time. But instead of going downstairs and finding my dog by the front window, I found him by the locked door that leads down to the basement. The fur on the back of his neck was standing up, and his nose was pressed to the bottom of the door. I instantly froze when I realized what was happening. There was something or someone on the other side of the basement door. I was barely a teenager at that time, so I began to panic and started making my way upstairs as quietly as possible. I woke both of my parents, but neither of them took me very seriously. My dad just assumed that my dog was hearing random noises coming from outside, but he did eventually go down to check things out. He said that everything downstairs looked normal, but he also mentioned that we forgot to lock one of the basement doors that night. Then, there was another time that I was up late in my room, but this time, Instead of hearing my dog growling, I heard a loud bark that echoed throughout the entire house. The sound was sudden and intense, similar to a gunshot, and it almost made me jump out of my chair. Assuming again that my dog had seen a cat outside, I quickly looked out of my bedroom window and tried to spot whatever he was barking at. But my heart suddenly dropped when instead of seeing a cat... I saw Lucas running out of our front yard in pitch black. I watched him run across the street and back towards his own house. And before I rushed to close the curtains and duck out of sight, I remember sitting there struggling to process what I had just seen 
and questioning why Lucas would be in our yard in the middle of the night. I told my mom about it the very next morning, and she said that she would bring it up to his mom. Because of these two instances, and because of the other details that I can't include, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that Lucas has been inside of our house in the middle of the night. If you knew the entire story behind this family, then you would also find the thought of this to be extremely disturbing. I do want to mention that this all happened years ago. My family no longer lives in that house, and those neighbors across the street are doing fine. But looking back on everything now, I'm realizing just how creepy the situation truly was. This happened last summer, and now the nights are getting lighter out, I am reminded of the fear that I experienced. I was in my second year at my company, my first job, and I wanted to live alone. There were girls I wanted to flirt with, and I couldn't be bringing them back to my parents' house. It would be my first time living alone, so I picked a place pretty close to work. I am pretty slow in the mornings. I found a nice enough apartment, and the rent didn't seem that frightening, so I pulled the trigger. The move coincided nicely with my summer vacation. I had a couple of weeks off, and after the move, I was in no hurry up early. I slept in. Every day that I was off work, I seemed to stay up later and get up later. I loved reading message boards online especially 2chan. And one night, I was up late. It was about 2 a.m. I heard a terrifying noise. The doorknob of my front door started to turn. It sounded like someone tried the door handle. I'm not gonna lie, it scared the hell out of me. It's creepy enough if you get a knock at the door or someone goes for the doorbell at night. But when someone just grabs the doorknob and tries it, that's a different level. I sat at my computer desk watching the doorknob for a few minutes in silence. It didn't turn again, and that was it. I thought I had better call it a night at that point. I thought about what just happened, and I wondered if it was a friend of mine, or maybe a drunken neighbor, mistaking my apartment for his. I guessed that it was the latter. The next night I was up again late, and the same thing happened. At around 2 a.m., the doorknob violently turned. I had to do something even though I was terrified. I tiptoed over to the door. I put my eye to the peephole. However, when I looked, whoever was out there was already gone. The mysterious person who was trying my door handle continued to harass me for another two nights. And on a fifth night, I invited my friend over to drink with me. I was pretty stressed by it, so having my friend over for some beers was exactly what I needed. He ended up bringing a friend too, so there were three of us drinking. We ran out of booze and snacks at around 2am, and luckily for me, there was a 7-Eleven about 30 seconds walk from my new place. I decided or forgot to lock the door and I just headed to the shop. I mean, two of my friends were in there, so I thought that it would just be fine. I left my apartment and a couple of seconds went by. I was in the hallway making sure that I had my wallet on me and my phone. I suddenly, my apartment door opened and then slammed shut. I instantly thought that whatever had been trying to get in had finally found its chance. I pushed thoughts of the paranormal aside and I ran in to speak with my friends. I asked, Hey, did one of you guys just open the door? They looked at me puzzled and my friend's friend replied, Wasn't that you opening the door just now? To be honest, I was more than buzzed. 
I had a fair few beers and that recent incident made me desire more. On the way to the store, I mulled things over in my head and I decided that I might just be imagining things or making mountains out of molehills. I went back to my apartment with a new attitude. I felt like telling my friends about the spooky things going on with the doorknob and we had a heck of a laugh over it. Well, it really took the edge off of the situation, you know? When I tried to explain why I was scared, I ended up laughing. I could see how absurd I had been. My friend and his friend ripped on me, and I guess I deserved it. We got back to drinking and we stayed up late. It turned into a really good night in the end, and nothing spooky happened after that. I had always assumed that whatever the doorknob turning thing was, it was paranormal. I don't know, maybe it was the images it conjured in my head when I heard it so late. Also, I never saw the culprit, so I kind of thought, Whoa, I'm dealing with the unknown here. The doorknob never turned while I was looking through the peephole, so I guess that it could have been some kind of mischievous person in the neighborhood, or a would-be home intruder. These things are usually explainable. If it's a human, you know a stalker, a thief, or someone else, and that's just as scary as the paranormal for me. It wasn't as if the problem was solved. But I will say one thing, though. I didn't hear the doorknob turn at 2 a.m. the following night, or any night after for that matter. Instead, the bad dreams came. I was suffering, the nightmares I was having were so real and frightening, it was really affecting my day-to-day -day life. These nightmares were kind of abstract, so stay with me here. I dreamt of a woman who kind of manifested through the ventilation fan, like the ring. You know where she crawls out of the TV? This one. But she crawled out of the ventilation fan. She defied gravity. She could plant her feet and hands on the wall and crawl down on it. She twisted and turned like she was a crab walking on the walls, and it was hideous. I would see this nightmare roughly twice a week at first, then it became three times a week, and at one point I was so distracted, it was all that I could think about. When early autumn came around, I decided enough was enough. I needed to take a look at that fan, or at least replace it. I didn't want to do it after work at night, so I waited for the weekend, and then took the fan apart with my tools. I really wanted it gone. It was dirty inside the fan, and I mean I expected it, but it was black with dirt in there. Then, I found something that deeply disturbed me. There was something taped with duct tape in the back of the ventilation pipe. I ripped the age rough tape away and I heard a plinking kind of sound. Something fell. They slid down the ventilation pipe as if it was a slide. It was three blackened molar teeth that landed on my linoleum floor. I nearly fell off the chair that I was stood on. The initial shock I felt gave way to depression, not for myself but somehow it felt second hand. Like, it wasn't mine. I doubt I'm making any sense, but I might as well finish my story. Now, in most movies or works of fiction, the person in my shoes might be running to the temple, or maybe a shrine, a church, or whatever that set things straight. They might even dig into the building's history, or ask about former residents. But I didn't. I couldn't. It's not just who I am. I just threw the teeth I found in the burnable trash, and I'm sure that's the same as cremation, I guess. I mean, in Japan, you would pay to get things burned to purify yourself and set the soul of the tormented at peace. But hey, the garbage gets burned, doesn't it? Sorry, there isn't much of an ending here. The only ending I can share is that the ending of my nightmares, so whatever I did, it worked. Well, for now, I guess.
This was a weird experience that I had when I was in high school. It happened when my friends and I went to play with our airsoft guns. A survival game is what we call it. There were about 10 of us in all. We used to use this abandoned hotel. It was completely dilapidated and falling apart in places. There were loads of debris in there, making it perfect to pop up and shoot one another. The best thing about it was that it was so far away. There were literally no houses or anything like that nearby, and if we played at night, there would be no chance of us being disturbed. Because some of the kids from our school thought that it was haunted, they didn't even go anywhere near it, not even the bullies. So it was perfect. We really felt like it was just ours, you know? I would sometimes get a bit freaked out in there. I mean, it was a creepy abandoned hotel. On top of that, it was said to be haunted. So who wouldn't be a bit on edge, right? My friends would make fun of me every time I got freaked out, though. I usually got swept up in the excitement of it all, and then forgot about that nagging eerie feeling that the abandoned hotel produced. But not this time. There was something off that night. After playing intensely for a while, we went up to the fifth floor, and there was a big open room pretty much rid of any debris. We would use that room to chat and make sure that all of our guns were working and etc. And while everyone was gathered, I asked, Did any of you feel anything was a bit off in the hotel today? Like, do you sense anything with us? They said that since what we do when we play airsoft is aim our guns at one another, we are bound to have our senses heightened but some did agree that something felt different that night. Just as we were discussing this, we heard some footsteps on the stairs below, and they resounded through the hotel. We hadn't heard any cars or motorbikes approaching, and like I said before, we were in the sticks. There was nothing but overgrown weeds and bushes surrounding the hotel. Everyone had flashlights, it was a rule. A couple of my pals shone their flashlights through the window down below, and we couldn't see any cars or anything. I was relieved as I was worried that the cops had arrived. All that was down there were our bikes. If someone was here, they would have had to walk halfway up a mountain in the dark on roads with little street light. Weird. We still heard those footsteps down below. One of my friends opened the door to our room on the fifth floor and asked, Are you the police? We were just playing here, that's all. When no response came from down below, someone else called. Are you here for ghost hunting or something? Again, nothing but the footsteps of someone below climbing the stairs ever closer to our floor. Some others piped up with questions. What do you want? Do you need some help or something? If we shouldn't be here, we can go. But no matter what anyone said, the only reply we got was the sound of someone slowly climbing the stairs. I had already been on edge most of the night, but now I was freaked. Fear was spreading through our group, in fact. My friends murmured. Whisper, guys. We don't know what's down there. No one. Run. Just walk calmly. And we left our room and entered the hall. We headed towards the opposite steps which we had heard the footsteps come from. And just as we reached the opposite stairs... We heard those same chilling footsteps land in the hallway. We couldn't see anyone. It was terrifying. Then something completely unexplainable happened. It looked for a second as if someone was pointing a light at us. A light. Not like that of a flashlight. It was there shining in front of us. It was circular and it swayed and bobbed. And it scared the hell out of us. 
We bolted. We all burst past one another in an effort to get out as soon as possible. We heard a terrible noise from above, like something had turned the whole fifth floor upside down. We could still hear the sound of someone pacing around on the stairs and in the lobby up there. I cannot describe to you how terrified I was. We were all shouting and cussing as we ran to our bikes outside. One of my friends was having engine trouble with his bike and it wouldn't start. We were screaming at him to get it going while all of our eyes were fixed on the hotel. Finally, he got it working and we all sped out of there. We all pulled into a convenient store's parking lot at the bottom of the mountain and we felt safe there. After we calmed down a little, we spoke about what had happened. I can't speak for my friends because I didn't witness this, but more than a couple of them said that they had seen some faces peering out at us from the windows above while we tried to get our pal's bike started. We stared towards the mountain in the direction of the hotel, and I think we all knew at that point that none of us would ever go back there again. I have a fairly short and really weird story about one time when I used Craigslist to find a rental. At the time I was living with my aunt and uncle, and I was working to find a new place, they weren't really pushy about me getting out of their home, but they were definitely wanting their space back. I appreciated them letting me stay, and I could take a hint, so I decided that I would go and try to find a new place. Enter Craigslist, the world of weird people selling things at a low price. I decided that I would hop onto the internet version of Kmart and see what was available nearby. On the plus side, I didn't have much to move. I could get it all out and in within a few hours. It was really just a bed, a dresser, and a fish tank. Everything else could fit in a duffel bag. Obviously, with only that going for me, I was looking for a small place to stay, like preferably a studio or something. After searching, talking to a bunch of weirdos, and blocking a few numbers, I found what looked to be a dream come true, a fully furnished, ready-to-move studio apartment that was in a decent part of town. I contacted the owner and after a quick chat on the phone, we had set up the time for me to move in that following Monday. So long as I could wire him the deposit money by the Friday before. At that time, it was Wednesday, so I had two days to get him the money. Thankfully, I had this plan for a little while, so I did have some cash set aside to get this done. And he only wanted $500 for the deposit, which was going to be a bit more than half the rent per month. After discussing it with him and sending him the money via whichever money transfer app we used, he had mentioned that the deposit would cover the first month. It was the middle of the month so it was good with me, and that on the first month, I would owe my normal 750 I was perfectly fine with this arrangement, and Monday came around and I showed up with my truck filled with my few items and my clothes. When I got there, he was standing outside the studio, and we chatted about the location as he gave me a quick tour. It was a nice little place, perfect for me, and it had everything that I could have wanted. I actually asked him about the furnishings, why he was renting it out with everything in it, and by everything, I mean everything. There was a TV, with a console connected to it a stereo on the side of the room, and a bookshelf loaded with popular books. He mentioned that he used to rent it as an Airbnb, which is why it was furnished, and that he was just tired of dealing with people like that, so he wanted to rent it out to an actual long-term tenant. It sounded good to me at that time, so I just thanked him and told him that I would have the rent to him on the first, 
and I signed the contract he had typed up, and that was that. Well, that wasn't actually that. In fact, it was not that at all. I lived there for a total of three days from Monday to Wednesday, and on Wednesday night, I was sitting on the couch watching TV when I heard someone talking out in the hallway of the apartment. I figured it was just the neighbors, until I heard the key hit the lock and the door opened. I cannot express the awkward moments that followed. The couple that walked into the apartment looked at me like I was a robber. I was looked at them like they were breaking into my apartment, and I think we all just kind of wanted to scream in terror. They asked who I was, I told them that I was the tenant, I asked who they were, and they said they were the tenants. Well, long story short, and after a lot of loud talking and confusion, we figured out what had happened. They were the real tenants, and they had been out of town for the last week. I was not actually the tenant, and was basically sold an occupied unit by someone that didn't have the rights to do so. I showed them my lease, they showed me theirs, much more official looking lease. I showed them the messages in the email and the proof that I paid someone. And, well, they lived there, so they didn't really have to show me anything. What was worse is that they didn't know the guy that I had paid, as the app that I paid with said that his name was something like Mario, and they really had no idea who he was. We ended up getting the police involved so that we could make a report for the whole situation because it was just so messed up. In the end, I apologized for eating their food and using the furniture, and we agreed that I could leave my stuff there for a couple of days so I could move back into my aunt and uncle's house, mostly just my fish tank and my dresser, as they were heavy and hard to move. Thankfully, they were fairly polite with me, considering that I was basically an intruder in their home, and thankfully, they believed me and didn't just resort to violence or anything like that. Unfortunately, I was never able to get a hold of the landlord, or supposed landlord, to give him a piece of my mind and was out of $500. I did keep in touch with a couple that actually lived there, and they never figured out how the guy got the key to their apartment, and they had the actual owner change the locks immediately. So, that's my weird story about the time that I rented a unit that wasn't for rent. I ended up finding a place that was legit on Craigslist, and then I moved in. And thankfully, there were no more late night surprises. I know this story wasn't terribly creepy per se, but, but it's still scary to think that this guy had the wherewithal to coordinate this while the couple was out of town and that he had a key to their place without their knowledge. In the end, it's just one of those weird, creepy life lessons. Sometime after getting my job at Walmart in 2008, I was looking for ways to make some extra money, so I started to list some things on Craigslist to sell. I listed my first generation iPhone for sale, and I received quite a bit of calls about it. One girl offered me a little more than I asked for if I would meet with her that day to sell it to her. Being that I was looking to make extra money, I agreed. We spoke on the phone and then agreed on a time and place to meet. Fast forward a few hours later, at about 7pm, we still had daylight, I went to the place she told me that she wanted to meet at, and no one was in the parking lot. We agreed to meet at a public place with lots of people, and I honestly had no idea about the area where I was. I started to feel a little off about this transaction, and it was a few cities over from where I lived. Initially, I refused, but I just kept thinking that I could really use the extra money at that point. I stupidly let her choose a place because talking to her, I got the vibe that she was a good person. 
I used that term as loosely as it could be, so I trusted her judgment, believing that another woman could not do anything to me. She calls me after I had waited for her for about 25 minutes and tells me that her car broke down a few blocks away, but she was still completely interested in buying my iPhone. I asked her for the directions, and I drove to meet her. By the time I made it to where she told me she was, it had gotten dark. Naturally, I felt weird about meeting her, but again, I was desperate for extra cash at this point. I sat there in my car with the windows rolled up, looking for a broken down car, and there was none in sight. I got scared and said, Ah, to hell with this, I'm leaving. And up walks this tall, skinny, tan girl, and a short and stocky girl. Hey, are you Hannah? I said. Yes, hey, BB, she says. And yes, this is my friend Margo. Can I see the phone? Sure, I said. I take the phone and show it to her and tell her that it works great and that I'm only selling it because of an emergency. But all of a sudden, someone hits me in the face and I was disoriented for a moment and confused to what happened. Then I see both of them running away with my phone. I was pissed, to the highest level of positivity, but not because they stole the phone, but because she hit me. To give you a background about me, I am a former kickboxer, and I'm a pretty thick girl, but I take no shit, especially if you hit me. So I ran after those bitches and ended up catching the thicker girl, Margot. I grabbed her by her hair and rammed her head into my knee, and then proceeded to beat the hell out of her. The other one comes back as I am on top of Margot, and she's trying to pull me off, but being that I was kickboxing heavily at this time, I was able to keep Margot beneath me by kicking her under her arms and ribs with my knees to keep her down. The other one screams, Get up, you bitch! And starts to wail on me with the most weakest punches ever. Blood is literally everywhere. Margot's face was nearly unrecognizable when I was done with her. She had already dropped my phone, but I was highly pissed because she hit me. I get up off of her, and they start to run off, basically with their tails in their ass. I got my phone back along with a headache from the punch. I called the police to report what happened and found out that it was actually a rock she hit me with. A 10-pound rock to be exact. I went to the emergency room to treat my wound, but nothing has become of it to this day. After that, I ended up getting robbed at gunpoint for my iPhone on Craigslist. You would think after the first incident that I would be done with Craigslist, but hell, what can I say? I just hope that it wouldn't be as bad as the first. Well, obviously, I was wrong. I really love Craigslist. I'd estimate that I've met maybe 300 people for buying and selling stuff. And for the most part, everyone was nice and harmless. However, I did run into two creeps who made me rethink meeting strangers alone to sell stuff. FYI, I was an early 20s female at that time. The first guy. It was 2009 and I am staying with my parents for the Christmas holidays in a small town in Florida. I'm going through my childhood room and cleaning out the closet, and I find a giant CD holder full of maybe a hundred really shitty CDs. Think Nickelback, Aqua, and etc. It's the 21st century, no one uses CDs anymore, and I figure that I'd try to sell the CDs on Craigslist, so I put up a listing. 100 CDs from the late 90s and early to mid 2000s, mix of pop and rock, all for $35 OBO. The next day, 
I get an email from a guy named John at around 2 p.m. He says that he's in town temporarily and that he wants the CDs. He says that he can pick them up after dinner at around 8 p.m. I email him back my address and also my number and I tell him to text or call when he's on his way. 8 p.m. comes and goes and I figure that I've been stood up, which happens often on Craigslist, so no big deal. My dad works for a liquor distribution company and would often do demonstration nights at restaurants and bars and would come home at bar closing time. This night, he gets home at around 3 a.m. I'm in college and a total night owl, so I'm still up probably eating junk food, surfing the web, and watching horror flicks. I hear a car pull up, and I look out the window and see him sitting in his car eating food. He often stops at Taco Bell on his way home and eats it in his car so my mom doesn't know that he's cheating on his diet. Maybe 10 minutes later, my dad comes in and shouts my name. There's someone here to see you. Can you please tell me why a strange man is showing up at our house at 3 a.m.? Huh? I go downstairs and my dad says that some guy pulled up in the driveway and asked for me by name. I walk outside with my dad and this guy who is maybe mid-30s gets out of his car and he says that he's the Craigslist guy who wanted to buy my CDs. My dad goes back in the house. I tell the guy it's really, really late to be stopping by, especially without texting first. However, since I'm awake, I just go and grab the CDs. He then proceeds to drone on and on about why he's buying the CDs. He says that he's engaged to a woman that he loves very much, and all he wants to do is make her happy. He said that last week, someone broke into her car and stole all of her CDs. She was really upset, and he wanted to make it up to her. He looked on Craigslist and found my listing, and was really excited because I had a bunch of CDs she used to have. A weird thing is, I didn't list any of the artists or bands because I was lazy, but I didn't think about it at that time. Anyway, he said that he was getting it for her as a Christmas surprise. He said he was staying with his future in-law somewhere nearby and that their family barbecue ran really late, which is why he never made it by 8 p.m. By this point, I've lost interest and in say something along the lines of, That's sweet, but next time you should probably call or text a Craigslister instead of just showing up. And I hand him the CDs, and he hands me cash and I go back inside. Three days later, I start getting texts from an unknown number. Texts like, Hey, I don't know my way around this town. Care to tour guide? I could really use a massage. Where can I get a massage in this town? You're Asian. Do you do massage? Would you take $40 for an hour massage? Happy ending? And I respond finally with, Who the hell is this? And he answers, Oh, sorry. I bought the CDs from you the other day. Do you, Squirt? I didn't respond, obviously. I show my friends that night and we laughed it off. And then the next day I get more texts. I still have your address. I'm at the Bank of America near your neighborhood. I just got the $40, babe. Only three minutes away. Are you home? You bitch. Stop ignoring me. I'm almost there. I immediately ran downstairs to tell my dad and mom. It was nighttime, so we shut off all of the lights outside and inside my house. My mom, little brother, and I went in my parents' room in the back of the house. My dad hid behind the curtains of the front bay window with a shovel in his hand. And a few minutes later, I heard him run down the front hallway, fling the front door open and run outside, 
We heard some faint shouting, so we all walked out of the bedroom. And by the time, my dad came back in with his shovel, his face red and his hair all disheveled. Apparently, the guy came driving down our street really slow. My dad recognized the car and went running outside with a shovel, yelling obscenities at the guy. And the guy peeled off and never came back or texted me again. The Second Guy I was moving from Florida to D.C. and I was going to load up my car as much as I could with stuff. However, I lived on the third floor plus a bit of a walk from my assigned parking spot. So I figured that I could use some help. I posted an ad on Craigslist Gigs and I said that I was looking for someone to help me load some heavy items like TV, desk, and etc. in my car. And less than an hour's worth of work, I'd pay $45 or whatever. I give the very first responder my number and address, and he shows up. He was probably 5 foot 8 and 350 pounds of pure fat. The sweat and smell coming off this guy in the Florida heat was pretty nauseating, but I didn't care as long as he did the job right. While he was carting heavy stuff, I was loading lighter things. Whenever I'd go upstairs to grab another load, he'd hurry after me so he could walk back up the stairs behind me. I had the door propped open so he didn't have to worry about me needing to unlock the door for him or anything. And when he'd follow me up the stairs, he made this weird grunting noises, but I assumed that it was because he was out of shape. Eventually, everything's loaded properly, save for some sweat smears on my stuff. I pay him, and then he drives off. I go back in my place to finish loading and cleaning, and I go out maybe 45 minutes later to put another load in my car. And I see his truck is back, parked across the street from mine. He's sitting in the driver's seat looking at me. When he sees me notice him, he looks away. I walk over to his window and knock. He rolls it down, and I ask if he needs any help or if he was lost. I was really confused as to why he had come back, and I knew he didn't live near me. He didn't say anything, and just rolled his window back up and then drove off. Um, okay, whatever. Of course, five minutes later, my phone starts blowing up. I don't recognize the number, so I don't answer the calls. Then the texts start rolling in. It says, I bet you taste salty and sweet. I answered, Who is this? And he replies, You're pussy. What are you up to tonight? I can come back over. I get the sinking feeling that it's the Craigslist guy. He had never called me about the job when I gave him my number, so I didn't know what his number was. He sent me another text. I like your pink panties. Then I realized that he was looking up my dress when I was walking up the stairs, and I immediately felt like a total idiot for wearing a dress that day. He then started dialing my number over and over again. I didn't know how to do the block number thing through Sprint, so I just had to turn my phone off. Later, I was with my guy friend grabbing a bite and I turned my phone back on. I got another text from the guy about how he wanted to toss me around like a ragdoll and tie me up and make me beg for it. I show the text to my friend and tell him the story. The Craigslist creep then proceeds to start blowing up my phone again. So my friend answers and says that he's going to cut his dick off and feed it to his dog if he ever contacts me again. I moved the next day, so I never had to worry about him randomly showing up in his truck again. Since then, I've bought and sold stuff on Craigslist, but I always make people meet me at a public place. I also stalk people's email addresses their Google Plus accounts, and etc.
Just over 10 years ago, I was dating my first ever girlfriend. We had just gone public and came out to our parents officially. At that time, I was 15 and female, and she was 16 and female if memory serves. Both of us lived in accepting households and went to an accepting school. However, for whatever reason we went public, she went fully off the deep end for our final year together. I will quickly mention that she was really abusive throughout our entire relationship. I had just gotten out of an extremely abusive household, so I had a hard time recognizing the danger that I was in. It somewhat felt normal, but it got particularly bad this one night when she snapped, I guess. I'm hesitant to attribute her behavior solely to a psychotic breakdown. I think she was an evil person genuinely. To summarize the lead up to this quickly, she had recently, within about 5 months leading up to this, told me that she had 7 souls living within her, all of which hated me. They were all men from the Victorian era, more or less. She lost herself to these men as each one emerged so she would abuse me in a unique way. I'm going to give them aliases, even though they're not really real. And I'm still afraid of her, or them, I guess. Duke. Duke liked to choke me in my sleep. Harold hit me. Han would try to cut me with knives when I was sleeping. Theo would ignore me or give me silent treatment. Gerald would force himself on me while sleeping. And Tim would pick apart my appearance and bully me. But Alex, Alex was the worst, and the entity that I had to deal with the most towards the end. Alex was the present one this evening. He'd play paranormal activity and torment me with the creepiest shit you've ever seen. He would sing in the corner of the room in the dark. He would mutter to himself constantly. He would smile at me while saying things like, You'll die soon, or you don't have to fear me when I'm unarmed. He was into knives and sharp things. He never self-harmed, but would try to harm me regularly. He also convinced me that if I ever left him, he would kill me. I was 15, so I believed it. You may be wondering at this point where our parents were in all of this. My parents had just freshly divorced, and custody was being settled, so I stayed at my partner's place on the weekends and during some weekdays due to it being safer. Things were so messed up in my own household that it genuinely seemed safer at that time. This is also where my hesitancy comes in with the legitimacy of their psychosis. Whenever their parents were around, they would snap out of it, like literally a light switch. They could turn the crazy off and on like it was nothing, which made me think that they did this with the intention of harming me, not as a cry for help. Fast forward to the afternoon it happened, my final straw. We were downstairs, Alec slash my girlfriend and myself were watching TV. Their parents were going to be out for the whole day, and upstairs was their older sibling, who was a complete hermit. They kept to the room with soundproof headphones on. Well, Alex also hated this person for no real reason. I was sitting at the downstairs kitchen table, working on some homework, when I hear Alex start humming in the corner. I turn around and ask if they're okay. They do the creepy smile and nod thing. I went into freeze mode, and then I just went back to my homework while keeping a close but discreet eye on them. It always got bad for me when I reacted, but I had a feeling that they were about to have a violent outburst. They started walking over to the kitchen still humming, but there was a shake in their voice that I hadn't heard before. I looked up slowly and saw that they were taking a large paring knife out of the knife block and I remember my adrenaline started to kick in, and I looked around for ways to defend myself. 
To my surprise, they started walking away from me, not towards me. I watched them walk down the hallway and towards the stairs before they exclaimed, I'm going to freaking kill you, I presumed to their sibling. Something came over me, and before I knew it, I was booking up the stairs trying to stop them as they started running, knife in hand, up the stairs. I grabbed their pant leg and pulled them down a few steps. We both collapsed as their sibling opened their bedroom door and asked what was going on. Alex at this point turned around and struck me with a knife, leaving a gash on my arm and shoulder, and I retreated back downstairs as they calmly called out to their sibling. Nothing. I, I just tripped. I'm okay. Thanks. I ran to the kitchen downstairs, texted my parents to come and get me, and started cleaning and bandaging my arm. Alex returned at this point, and as soon as we made eye contact, they dropped the knife. They walked into the kitchen and sat on the floor, and started singing to themselves while rocking back and forth. I was stunned literally going into shock, and I stared at them, bloody tissues in hand and informed them that I was done with this bullshit and I was going to wait outside for my parent. They began crying through the song they were singing and still smiling like a maniac. I never went back after that. I broke up with them over the phone about a week later. They sobbed and told me that they'd get rid of their souls and that she still loved me. I didn't listen. I just hung up and that was that. She even dropped out of school and I literally never saw her again after that. Years later, I found out that she started dating this friend of hers that I was also familiar with as a teenager. Then found out that she was cheating on me with them for the entire time that her and I dated. I tried to feel bad for her for years but honestly, I'm still healing from the several attempts at my life. It's hard to feel bad for an abuser, let alone an attacker. So, thank you for letting me get this out of my chest. I've been in therapy for this recently, and I wanted to share it to kind of reflect on it also. If you have any questions or need clarification, let me know. I left a lot of information out just to keep this short. Back when I was single and I used some online dating pages, I had a few dates that were probably in the category of awful and painful, but only one that was really creepy. There was one time that I had matched with a girl named Cindy, and we talked for a bit, hit it off, you know? The basics start to a good thing when it comes to dating. And after chatting it up, we decided that we would want to meet for dinner the next night. We meet up, and she's exactly as she was in the pictures, and she was incredibly friendly. We had a quick conversation outside the restaurant, and then we went in to get our food. The dinner started out as perfect as it could have, and about 20 minutes in, after we had gotten our drinks and put in our food order, I noticed that there was a woman sitting at a table a few spots down that was glaring at me. At first, I thought she was staring at something behind me, but I was at the wall and there was nothing to stare. I mentioned it to Cindy, and I said, Hey, there's a woman that is sitting behind you. She's staring daggers at me right now. She put her hands over her face and said, Oh God, blonde, long hair, glasses? While this was a vague description, it was exact. This woman was blonde, had long hair, and thick glasses on her face. I told her that she was right and asked if she knew her. Come to find out, this woman that was murdering me with her eyes was Cindy's ex-girlfriend. I had no problem that Cindy was for both teams. What I had a problem with 
was the fact that I thought that this woman was going to legit murder me at a moment's notice. I asked if I should be concerned, and she said probably not, which was not at all convincing. And after a few moments, our waiter brings over our food, but we thank him and then he walks away. No more than 45 seconds later, Cindy's ex stands up and walks over to our table. Hey, Cindy. Uh, leave me alone, please. At this point, I could tell that Cindy and this woman did not break up in good terms. Cindy's face was visibly red, and I could tell that she was having a bit of a panic attack. Please, just go away. I don't like this one, the other woman said before she grabbed my drink off of the table and practically heaved it at me. She then said, See you around, to Cindy, then looked over at me and told me to watch my back and then walked away. Like that wasn't the most terrifying thing she could have said to me. So there I was, soda covering my food, my shirt and my pants, and the look on my face was probably one of complete and total shock. But thankfully, the waiter had actually seen what happened, so he rushed over and told me that he would get the manager and he would get the food taken care of. I wasn't really concerned about the burger, I was more so worried about Cindy and maybe a little bit for myself. By this point, Cindy was actually in tears. I asked her what was up with that woman and if she was actually in any danger. Honestly, I was just trying to gauge the situation and figure out if I needed to call the cops. She then proceeds to tell me that Amanda, the ex, was pretty much a stalker at this point. She had followed Cindy around on each date she had, ruined her relationships, and had even literally stabbed her last boyfriend. She said that it was only in his hand that he was completely alive and fine, but that he had broken up with her after this. She said that every time she thought Amanda was going to be gone for good, she would appear the minute that Cindy tried to move on. The worst part, this has been going on for two full years at this point. She said that she'd filed a restraining order, she contacted the police, and nothing was ever being done about it. She said that, for some reason, the authorities were taking it lightly and that they weren't really doing much to keep Amanda away. She told me that the stabbing incident had happened over three months ago and that she waited this long to see if maybe it would work to get rid of Amanda. Well, it didn't. Amanda was very much there and very angry. At the end of the date after we had dinner, and talk more about this, Amanda. Cindy told me that it was best that we didn't see each other again. She apologized and said that if Amanda ever disappeared entirely, she would give me a call and then maybe we could try again. I agreed and we went our separate ways. On my way home, I called my brother to tell him what had happened and he honestly laughed at me. He then told me that I was played and that Cindy was just trying to get free food, and that Amanda was her wing woman. I started to believe him, and I was actually a bit upset that I had fallen for it, and that they were such good actors. That is, until the next morning. I got up and got my coffee, then went to take my dog for a walk, when I saw the end result of Amanda's anger. My windshield was smashed and all four of my tires had been slashed, on top of that, the phrase, she's mine, was spray painted on the hood. Obviously, I called the police, got the report and made the insurance claim. Thankfully, I had good coverage. I also sent pictures to my brother and asked if he still thought that I was being played. In the end, I never spoke to Cindy again and I didn't message her to tell her about the damage to my car. I told the police about the night before, but they didn't really seem interested. Every now and then, 
I start to think about Cindy and I wonder if she's out there, if she's doing okay. I really do worry that Amanda may lose her mind and attack her one day. I guess my final thought to Amanda, the absolute psychotic ex-girlfriend of Cindy, I hope you and I never meet again. I met Trent when I was 30 years old. We met in a relatively old-fashioned way, mainly because I've always shunned online dating and I prefer meeting people face-to-face. -face. I've always trusted my gut instincts when I met people and we met at a town dance. I come from one of those country towns where everyone knows each other and there is a strong sense of community out here. While people are suspicious of strangers, they tend to turn a blind eye to bad behavior from people inside the community. It is one of the most frustrating parts of living in a community like this. And despite this, I love my hometown. Trent, it's a nickname by the way, was the cousin to one of the more well-established families in the town. If you're not from these small towns, it can be hard to understand, but essentially, many of their family have important businesses and own a considerable amount of property. Trent wasn't raised in the town and was raised in one of the big cities. Trent was charming, sweet, and caring. Everyone told me how lucky I was to be with him, and if we got married, I would be set up for life. We dated for nearly two years before we moved in together. Six months later, we were engaged, and he told me how he wanted to look after me. I've been raised by a long line of independent women who want to make sure that they make their own money. And over time, I was worn down by the promises and the hope of an easy life. I let him take care of the finances. We lived a good life, regularly going on expensive trips and restaurants, new clothes and a lot of items that I didn't really need. I was living the good life. My friends frequently told me how jealous they were that I found someone like this, and I thought that I was blessed too. Whenever I try to conserve our power usage, Trent would reassure me not to worry and that it was covered. I didn't like this. It was wasteful. Trent and I talked about having children together someday, what we would name the kids, how we would raise them, and what we wanted for our family. Trent wanted a massive family with around seven children. I'm not young by any means, and didn't really think that I could have that many. I told him this, and he was okay with it. I had three kids with him, who are my world, and I love each of them. And over time, my focus changed from us having a lifestyle around going out and socializing, to raising our children. I don't think he liked this as much and went out of his way to spoil our kids, buying them whatever they wanted whenever they wanted it. I told him that it was bad to spoil the kids, and so in the children's eyes, I was the big and mean mummy. He told me one day that he wanted to leave the quiet country town that we had called home, a place that I lived all my life. We talked about it and looked for places that we could go. He seemed really panicked for some reason, but wouldn't tell me what was wrong. I kept asking him if I could help, and he got really snappy at me one day, and even punched the wall when he got so worked up. This wasn't the same man that I married. I woke up one day and all of his things were gone. He took a bag, left an apology note, and I called everyone. His family, his friends, the police... And there were no signs of this coming. Our children were so scared for their father and missed him terribly. It was when I found out the stash of bills and credit cards that had been taken out using my name. I stared in shock at them. He hadn't been paying the bills and there were final notices approaching. I had my first panic attack and woke up on the floor. 
I thought it was a nightmare, but it was reality. I called up the bank and utilities company, and anyone who would listen to me. I called my mom and my friends. I was terrified about what would happen. I was scared that I would lose my house, and I called my husband's number, begging him to come home and to sort all of this out. It turns out that Trent had been in debt and had done this sort of thing before. There is a police investigation, and I couldn't believe how stupid I was. It was taking years to properly clear my name and my credit. Financially, he destroyed me, and I wish I kept working to keep up my skills in the job market. But luckily for me, a family friend heard of my situation and gave me a job, advice, and also a place to stay while things were being sorted. It was hard on the kids. They were used to getting whatever they wanted, and then they had to make do with whatever they had. They asked where their daddy was all this time, and I'd lie to them, telling them that he loves them and he would come home someday. I try to look for him on social media when I have spare time. One time I found him, and he was already with another woman. As the investigation went on, I discovered that I wasn't the only woman that he conned and if he isn't stopped, I won't be the last. Ever since, I have been trying to repair my life. I'm trying to get a divorce, and at first, his family tried to brush it off or blame me for whatever happened. I'm not going to be silent over this. Some of the friends I had when I was living the high life disappeared when I needed them. Here is the advice that I have for any young woman or young man, or whatever out there. Don't blindly trust someone to manage your finances. Always at least, be involved in the process and keep an eye on your money. If possible, also keep up with your skills in case something happens where you need to rejoin the workforce. Because I really wish that I did. This all happened in August of 2017. I was 23, and I just moved back into my mom's place, which happened to be about 30 minutes from my nearest friend's place. My car broke down, so I was Ubering everywhere that I had to go. I went down to my friend's place to help them move. I went to Target to grab some champagne and orange juice, because I apparently hated myself and thought an imminent hangover was just a great idea. Fast forward to that night, and of course, I am doubled over throwing up with a migraine, and I can barely lift my head. And I have to work the next day's morning shift. My friends have no idea where they have any sort of over-the-counter meds for headaches, but of course, the stoner of the house offers me an edible. Now, I may have killed the bottle of champagne, but I haven't touched marijuana in years. I ate half of that edible, and I waited about 45 minutes to feel better and called my Uber. I was getting picked up in an apartment complex, and of course, had to walk to the front door to find the driver, because I have never met an Uber driver that can locate any address with accuracy. I get in the back seat, and he turns around to introduce himself. This guy is a southern drawl that would make molasses seem like water. It was at this moment that I realized that I messed up. I told him that I had a migraine and that I just wanted to go home. He pulls out a bottle of water that was already opened and some random pills and tells me that this should make me feel so much better. So, of course, I politely grabbed them and then proceeded to stuff them into the seat and then shove the water bottle in the pocket in front of me. We begin our 30-ish minute journey to my mom's apartment. If it weren't for Mary Jane coming along for the ride, I probably would have hopped out right then. This guy starts off the drive by telling me prison stories, and then, somehow, 
It delves into how the world is going to end by December 20-something of 2017. Every few sentences, he's now bringing up his bunker. He asked me constantly if I just wanted to head there instead of home. My high-ass self kept telling him that I'd love to, but I have work so I can't. So, maybe next time, I guess. His cycling through conspiracies from the Earth is flat to Kandahar, Afghanistan's giants. He says, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but look up Kandahar, Afghanistan on YouTube. Also, in case y'all didn't know this, the world ain't heliocentric. Just get a pair of binoculars and you'll see. At this point, he's telling me that he has an arsenal of guns. He asked me if I have guns and, and my liberal millennial ass tells him that I have a lot of guns. He grows opium at his bunker and again asks me to come with him. I am panicked. I'm texting everyone that I know, sharing my location, and I started recording. I managed to get about 7 minutes in total of this 30-minute drive on film. So, we're getting closer and closer to the exit that he needs to take to drop me off. He's still in the far left lane on this four-lane highway. I kept telling him to move over and that the exit is coming up. And this creepy-ass driver keeps telling me how well-stocked his bunker is. And then he misses my exit. Finally, I lose it. I start screaming at him to get me home and that my mom is waiting for me and that I have work tomorrow. He finally does get off the exit after I started kicking his seat, threatening to jump out of his moving car. I ran out of his car so fast when he hit the red light outside of the apartment complex. And as soon as I got inside, I tried telling my mom what happened, but she brushed it off and was more disappointed that I told her that I had taken an edible. The next morning, I coherently explained what actually happened and showed her the videos and then we reported him to Uber. I still take Ubers on occasion, but I will never use one while being alone or inebriated ever again. And this is the reason that I don't consume THC. The universe knows when I'm high and things like this happen to me. So, creepy Uber driver wanting to take me to his bunker. Let's not meet ever again. I, a 21-year-old female, had just started applying for a college in my area, and I needed to go on campus to take my test for my classes. I had recently gotten into a car accident, and my car was completely totaled, unfortunately, so that means that I needed to use something cheap and easy. Uber and Lyft are my go-tos in this sort of situation, However, unfortunately, Uber is the more expensive one between the two. In both apps, you're able to put up a profile photo to help the drivers identify you easier. So, I use this feature. This is important to remember, as I am white, but in the photo, I looked a little tan because of the lighting. Growing up, I was always told to be wary and safe when I went out in public. With that in mind, I can remember the driver was an older gentleman in his 60s around, I think. My apartment complex can be difficult to navigate since the GPS doesn't like to take you to the right building. I opted to use the text feature on the app just to help my driver find my building easier. And he read it. Keep this in mind. Once he found me, I got in, and he began the usual niceties that you have when you meet a stranger. He asked me if I was Hispanic, 
to which I replied no and that I'm white. He suddenly became quite talkative and started complimenting me a lot for not getting upset. The ride was about 10 minutes, and within that time span, he asked me if I was married or had any kids, if I had a boyfriend, whether or not that I lived alone, and if I had any pets. I'm typically very alert when I'm alone with someone, and this started setting off some bells in my head. I was vague and honest with my answers, which could have gotten me in trouble. And once our ride ends, he told me that since I was such a nice girl, that he would buy my lunch. He gave me $20 and tried to continue talking to me while I was getting out of the car. I took the $20 because I truly needed it and I was afraid to make him angry, but I wasn't interested in continuing this conversation with this older guy. After I finished my test, my proctor pulled me aside and gave me a piece of paper with my phone number on it. Turns out, it was my Lyft driver's phone number. He tried to enter the building and talk to me while I was taking my test, and thankfully, my proctor had my back and had to get the campus police officer to escort him off the property since he wouldn't leave. I never saw him again, and fortunately, I had already given him a good rating, so I continued to get him on occasion. I always canceled that ride as soon as I realized that it was him. I never reported it because I was afraid of causing waves, but if I get him again, I'll be sure to report him. I'm not sure if that would hold up anymore, since it was already a few months ago. My Uber driver freaked me out after changing routes. A little context for this one, just so you know, this ended up being longer than I expected. I'm a 32-year-old female. I live in a country where women get murdered in staggering numbers. About 10 to 11 are killed daily, according to statistics, and most of these murders go unpunished. Hell, many don't even get investigated by police. These murders range from domestic abuse to random abductions. For example, several women have been abducted in regular taxis and services like Uber, and then their bodies turn up abandoned with signs of rape and sexual abuse. As for my story, I usually get around town in my own car, but I've used Uber on multiple occasions. This is not Uber bashing, by the way. Most times it is a safe and reliable service, which is why I use it. And I try not to be paranoid despite the stories of women that have gone missing this way. Anyway, this means that every woman I know has thought about what they would do if they found themselves in this situation. Stuff like being on the phone with someone the whole ride, not falling asleep no matter how tired slash drunk you are, sharing your location through another app, assessing whether jumping out of a moving car is worth the risk, and even carrying weapons. I carry a pocket knife and I learned how to use it. Survivors have told stories of their driver going quiet, turning off the app, and changing routes to streets they don't recognize. They try to pass it off as just taking shortcuts. That being said, one day after work, I had to take a taxi home, and I scheduled an Uber as usual. The car rolled up, the make and model matched, the plates matched, and the driver looked like the photo. So far, so good. I climbed inside the car, greeted the driver, and immediately shared my live location with my hubby, letting him know I was on the way. As an extra precaution, I always check the locks can be disengaged by hand, and bonus points to cars with windows that can be cranked down manually. The drive started at normal. The driver was an older guy, friendly. We struck up a conversation, you know, small talk. We found a lot of traffic and the driver asked if I wanted to take an alternate route. I pointed at an access road that I normally use to skip traffic, and he switched lanes. We were going down the access road, and this is when things started getting sketchy. He said that he made a wrong turn, and we kept driving farther and farther away from the main road, supposedly looking for a way to get back on track. The app was still running as normal, and the GPS was telling him how to get back on the main road but he kept ignoring it, saying that we were now too far away 
and that he knew another way to get to my destination faster. So this is when alarms start going off in my head, especially because we kept getting closer to a bad part of town. True, if you choose those neighborhoods, you can find another main road on the other side, but most people avoid it for being the aforementioned bad part of town. Like police don't even patrol these streets sometimes. As he drives deeper into the neighborhood, he notices I'm tensing up. Truth is, I was debating whether I should reach for my knife or if I was being super paranoid and the driver was honestly just trying to get to the other main road. So he starts telling me about the neighborhood and that I shouldn't be scared, that it was dangerous, but that good people live there. Honestly, I wasn't so worried about the people living in the neighborhood as it was about this guy taking the scenic route. So I started talking to him about how I was aware there was a road that crossed to the other side and that I knew exactly where I was. The conversation at some point turned to his daughter, who was college-aged, and I kept making as many parallels as I could between that girl and myself, hand on my pocket knife by this point, the other hand ready to unbuckle the seatbelt, while I kept an eye on the map to make sure we were getting closer to the other main road. And thankfully, we were. I did not begin to relax until I started recognizing where we were. We did eventually make it to my own neighborhood, and I made him stop a block before reaching my house. Didn't want the guy to know where I actually lived, and I skipped out of there as fast as I could. I really, really hope I was just being paranoid, and that I was never actually in any danger. But damn, that was an intense ride. This is not my story, but my husband's, and it happened to him about a decade ago. My husband, a white European, was then working in China for about a year now with a good friend of his, GJ, a native Chinese. They were both their early 20s. It was nighttime, and they had to make a transfer within a large city from Airport A to Airport B. So at Airport A, they got touted by a guy that offers to drive people without actually being a registered taxi service. Those were pretty common, and you probably can still encounter such people to this day in various countries. And seeing as it was a pretty ordinary thing, they had no qualms in taking him up after agreeing on a fare. They loaded up their bags, got in the back seat, and away they went. It was all going fine for the first bit of the drive. But then, they went into an industrial sort of area, and my husband and GJ were like, What? They demanded to know what was going on. The driver said something about needing to pick up a friend, and after a while, they stopped to pick up another guy who sat up in front with him. They didn't speak and were really quiet and shifty, and the driver seemed to drift a little aimlessly around the area. GJ was having none of that. He yelled at the driver to take them back to the main road and to their destination, saying that he knew a higher-ranking police inspector guy in the city. My husband was seated behind the driver, and he was pumped full of adrenaline, totally prepared to grab him from behind if need be. Thankfully, there was no funny business, and the driver quickly went back to the main road and then got them to Airport B. My husband reckons that they may have wanted to rob them and take their bags because Europeans have money, which is a bad stereotype. He was actually broke as fuck. But gladly, nothing of the sort materialized. They probably might have been abandoned there or worse. Good to know to be confident about flaunting your connections, even if they're real or not. I've worked in restaurants for almost 10 years, so I'm accustomed to getting out late. One night, after finishing a double shift at a ramen spot, I had my usual beer and I decided to Uber home. My Uber arrived, and I checked the plate and all, and the gentleman confirmed my name. I spent half of the ride almost dozing off. 
As the ride progressed, I noticed the driver kept staring at me through the mirror, never said a single word, no expression, just a blank stare. I figured exhaustion and the beer had gotten the best of me, and he was probably steering because he thought that I was drunk. And later on, I also noticed that he had taken a different highway and that we were making our way through Rikers Island. It was a route that I wasn't accustomed to, but he had his ways open and I figured that he was trying to take some sort of shortcut. We kept getting further into Rikers Island and the area had become full of trees and construction machines, neon cones, and also crack cement. And then he came to a sudden stop. My car just broke. Get out and call a new Uber. I was confused. There hadn't been any indication that a tire had popped or it had ran out of gas or etc. I go out and before I ask anything, he stepped on the gas and then sped off with a car perfectly fine. Alone by a construction zone, I started freaking out and then I called another Uber. When he arrives, his first question was why I was in the middle of nowhere, especially that it was so late. It was around 1am at this point. I told him about the Uber driver and he urged me to report it. I reported it, I checked the profile, it had 4.8 stars, the same license plate, but it was not the same man in the picture. The report never really got anywhere, but I can't help but feel that I encountered a possible murderer or rapist. When my sister and I were younger, we were left at home by ourselves a lot. My parents split up, and my mom had custody of us. She worked a lot so she would get us off to school in the morning. Then, I had a key to the house to get in when we got home because she would be working till 6 or 7. I was in 8th grade and my sister Taylor was in the 6. 6 through 8th was middle school so we went to the same school and rode the same bus. It was a normal routine, but we would get home, call mom on the home phone to let her know that we made it, finish our homework before she got home, and then we would have the rest of the time to do whatever. After homework, we would watch TV, play in our room, or sometimes call the neighbor kid over to hang out. The neighborhood was pretty great growing up. There were tons of kids around to play with, and older people that were always willing to pay you to rake their leaves or shovel snow. When we were younger, one of the ladies used to come over and watch us. I told my mom that I was old enough to handle myself and Taylor, so she slowly let me do so. She'd let me stay home if she had to take Taylor to an appointment, or let us both stay home if she had to run to the store. This school year, though, she started letting us go home alone, which had been really great. She said that as long as she never heard us complaining about the other when she got home and our homework was done, then she would let us continue doing this. Taylor and I always made sure to work things out before she got home so we didn't lose such a privilege of being home alone. One day, after calling my mom, she told me that she was going to be running a little behind but that she'd call when she was on her way home. Seven o'clock rolled around and she called saying that it was going to be a little longer than she thought so she was going to order pizza for us. After discussing our options and arguing over toppings, the order was placed. She told me when they arrived to get the food since it was already paid for and tipped, and then we should close the door and lock it again. 
we were not to open the door for anyone but her, unless she calls and tells us someone is supposed to be coming over. So, we sat watching TV and waiting, when the doorbell rang. I really thought nothing more than it must be the pizza guy, because it was late and mom said that no one else was supposed to be coming over. But to my surprise though, when I opened the door, it was three guys, all wearing bandanas over the bottom part of the face and immediately rushing in and shutting the door behind them. I remember screaming and Taylor seeing everything and started crying. One of the guys tried putting his hand over my mouth and the other one ran to Taylor, shushing her, as she tried to climb to the back of the couch. She wouldn't go towards the guy, and I tried my best to keep the one by me off of me. When the third guy pulled the gun out, he said that if we didn't keep quiet and do what he said, he would shoot us and wait for my mom to get home and shoot her too. Taylor started sobbing, and I tried to quiet her from the door. And once the gun guy was satisfied, he asked us where the basement was and made me lead them to it. The gun guy told the other two to take us downstairs and figure out how to secure us. We walked downstairs, Taylor still crying as he led us over to a pole behind the stairs where water drained from. I think it came from a bathroom upstairs. The other guy went through a laundry basket that was nearby as our washer and dryer was down there and pulled out two shirts to use to tie us up. He tied us back to back to the pole and knelt down in front of Taylor and whispered something about staying quiet. He told her to count to 100 in her head and then they would be gone. Then, he looked over to me asking if I knew if there was any jewelry or a safe in our home. I didn't know if my mom had a safe, but I did know that she had a jewelry box, but I told him no. He stared at me for what felt like forever with a raised eyebrow and stood up in motion to the other guy. The guy that tied us up went back upstairs and we heard a lot of stuff being moved in loud thumps. It seemed to go on for quite some time, and I remember asking Taylor what number she was at, and she said that she stopped counting. I can't really blame her though. However, as we sat there waiting for eternity to end, the doorbell rang. I assume it was the pizza guy, but whoever it was, I was happy they were there. The guy downstairs looked like he just saw a ghost and didn't know what to do. He asked me if we were expecting someone, and I told him pizza. He took off upstairs, shutting the door, so then we were in a dark and quiet basement alone. I heard a lot of what sounded like running but no talking. We sat there for several seconds as I started to work on untying myself. Taylor had started crying again, so I was trying to quiet her so I could focus on what was happening upstairs and also the untying. I finally got loose and I untied her as well, but I told her to stay there so she looked like she was still bound. I walked up two or three stairs when I started hearing walking again and then I paused. Then I heard someone shout, Hello? And I ran back over to Taylor and crouched. I heard the first steps get closer and the basement door was opened. Then I remember this next part because it was one of the best feelings ever. The voice said, Um, pizza is here. And I ran up the stairs to be greeted by a younger, tall, less intimidating guy in a pizza uniform. And then I started crying. I yelled for Taylor to come up and I remember unloading on the poor pizza guy. He actually got us to calm down and said that he had called the cops when he saw the guys running from the house. We called our mom, but apparently, she was already on her way and almost home. She had tried calling and got a busy signal, so she tried to rush home knowing that something was wrong. 
And once she got there, the pizza guy was talking to her about what happened with us right by her. Apparently, when they opened the door, they knocked him to the ground while the one pointed a gun into his face telling him not to move until they left. He said that he decided to come in and check if someone was hurt since someone had to have ordered food. After the cops looked around, they determined that they had stolen our game console that was in my room and a couple necklaces that my mom had hanging in the bathroom. Sadly, the pizza was a casualty too, but we weren't too hungry that night. My mom did give the pizza guy a big hug and a kiss on the cheek, and we hugged him too. It was a terrifying situation, but I was thankful that he was brave enough to come in and check instead of just leaving us. My mom doesn't like to leave us alone anymore, unless it's during the day and the neighbors know too, so they can check on us. I believe they did end up catching at least two of the guys because I remember my mom taking us to identify their faces. I hope I never have to do that again because that alone was overwhelming. Right after graduating high school, I dipped from my mom's place. I just couldn't stand the guy she dated or had around, and she didn't seem to care how much I felt, so I was done. I had saved up most of my money while I was working in school, and I got myself a cheap car, so I didn't have to rely on her. Then, the weekend after I graduated, I got as much of my stuff in my car that I could, and then I left. I still talked to my mom, so I knew the rest of my stuff would be okay there, but I just really needed out. For the first few years, I lived with friends or cousins, and I just kept most of my stuff in my car. A few months before my 20th birthday, I had a friend offer to get an actual place together, so it would be in both of our names. I agreed. And then soon after, we got a nice little duplex that was perfect for us. It was a two-bedroom with a full basement. We ended up turning the basement into a party and gaming room. He had an Xbox set up down there, his computer, and even a stereo system. We ended up finding a foosball table that we brought home and put down there and made some makeshift ping pong table. It was a nice little place to hang out, and I really loved it. We got to know the neighbors, and a few of them were younger couples around us with kids. There was a guy that lived with his on-and-off-again girlfriend across the street that had come over a few times that we got to know. Then, there was a guy in the duplex attached to us. It was a guy probably in his late 30s. He usually kept to himself. Like, he may nod or smile at us if we were outside, but that was it. However, he did have his share of guests. Most of them showed up with hats and sunglasses on and never acknowledged anyone. They always immediately went inside. There were other times where it would really be late at night and we would see a car's headlight pull in and sit there till our neighbor ran out to the car. They would exchange something and then run back in. We could piece things together after a few of his visitors, but nothing ever happened over there, and he also never bothered us. It just became more of a minding our own business and never thought much else about it. A little over a year later, we renewed our lease and were getting ready to have a party for my 21st birthday. I remember us going to get snacks and drinks. My friend was 22, so he bought the drinks, of course. And we were just having one hell of a party. We probably had a dozen people over. Downstairs, out back, in the living room. It was a great time. I know, I drank a lot, but I was home. So once I was done, I passed out in my room. Later that night... 
I started to hear a lot of thumping that sounded like it was coming from the next door. The wall that my bed is against is the joined wall of our neighbors, so we can hear a lot when you're in the bedrooms and sometimes the living room. I was pretty out of it, of course, but I remember waking up to use the restroom. When I came back, that's when I started hearing all the sounds. First, it was just single thumps, like someone slamming a door or maybe even dropping something. I then started hearing grunts and muffled yelling. I didn't really think much of it and couldn't really process between being tired and also drunk, so I just passed back out. The next morning though, I woke up to more pounding, but this time, it sounded like it was coming from our door. So, I got up, groggy as hell, and I made my way to the front door. I thought maybe it was one of our friends coming back to get something that they left maybe, but unfortunately, it was not. I opened to see two cops standing at my door. They introduced themselves and vaguely explained at first that there was an ongoing investigation and said that they had some questions. I offered to let them in, but they stayed near the entry. They asked me if I was home last night, and when I told them that I was, as well as several others for a party, they asked if anyone else was in the house. I assumed my roommate was, and they told me to get him and anyone else inside. I quickly went and knocked on my roommate's door to get him up, asked if he knew if anyone else stayed over, and he mentioned someone being downstairs. I went down there, and I woke up our friend and her boyfriend, and I got them upstairs with us. The cops then had us all go outside and asked to search the place. With our guests back at their car, my roommate and I asked what was going on. They said that they got a call for a welfare check on the man next to us and said that they found him. Dead. They said that it appeared that he had been robbed, so they wanted to check with us to see if we heard or saw anything and make sure that we could account for all of our guests. I certainly knew everyone that came over and didn't suspect any of them being the killer. The cop then said that they were more concerned if anyone was here that showed up unexpectedly or was acting suspiciously. I again said that I couldn't recall anyone like that and we gave them permission to look over the place to make sure no one was hiding in there. That was terrifying enough that the thought that we could have been hiding a killer. I went ahead and let my friends that were there know that they could leave, of course with the permission of the other cop. I didn't feel like telling them what had happened and they seemed like they just didn't want to be around the cops, so they left pretty quickly too. As I walked back to the door, I noticed the window of our neighbor's place had been broken and the screen door nearly ripped off the hinges. And after they search, they told us that it looked like someone had nearly pulled off the back door handle, so they dusted for prints. They said they most likely saw all of the people and took off instead of targeting us, especially if the suspect was alone. They had a few more questions for us before finally leaving us to comprehend what all just happened. We were in a bit of a shock and it was quite sobering unfortunately. I think it was the following day, we had a news fan drive by taking pictures and recording, which was weird, till we saw it on the news that night. They were talking about our neighbor. They said that he had been strangled and found by police after his sister tried calling multiple times and not getting an answer. My friend thinks that since he was a seller or maybe a user, that he was targeted and probably robbed for whatever he may have had. The fact that they tried us did worry me a bit. Was their plan to make sure that we didn't talk or maybe see anything? Was it just a robbery gone bad? Did he think that he would hang out at our party 
and just blend in. It was a bit worrisome at night. Sometimes, wondering if they would come back till the news reported that they had arrested someone in relation to this case, so that definitely made me feel better. I think the place sat empty for several months before we got a new neighbor. It was an older couple, which put a damper on our parties, but at least we knew that they probably wouldn't have shady guests around. This happened to me and my wife when we were in our 30s. We lived in a fairly popular city, surrounded by houses on all sides, and a couple blocks east was the shopping side with grocery stores, restaurants, and even a farmer's market popping out of there on the weekends. We liked going to the market because my wife was due soon, and it gave us a place to walk that was outside and close to our home. And not to mention, she ate so many tomatoes while pregnant, and she claimed they had the best ones. The neighborhood itself has always been nice, no real issues with anyone, and I think the cops were cold once because there were kids playing in the park nearby, and they were screaming a lot, and the people thought that something was wrong and called them. It turned out, it was just the kids playing around, but I think it gave them a nice scare not to scream so much. So, maybe some loud kids, but that was about it. One night in particular, the wife wasn't feeling well, so she went to bed early. I wasn't tired, so I stayed up for a bit longer to finish the show that I was watching. Just to get a better idea of the layout of our place, when you walk in the front door, you enter the living room. This is where I was watching TV. To the right is a hall with our bedroom, a bathroom, and also our nursery. Going straight from the front door, you'll go to the kitchen, and the wall to the left had a door to the garage. The back wall of the kitchen has an entryway to our little green room, I suppose you could call it. It had tall windows on all three walls and a sliding door on one that led to our backyard. We had some long curtains hanging on all the windows because it can get pretty hot back there and we use that as an office now and also extra storage. The yard wasn't fenced in, which was fine because the two houses next to us was owned by an older couple with no kids or pets and the other is owned by an older guy that appears to have his daughter and granddaughter visiting so no troubles with them too. So on this night, while I was watching TV, I thought I saw a light go by the window, like a flashlight or a reflector on a bike or something. I didn't really think much of it at first because it also faced the road so I thought it probably was a bike passing. After a few minutes, I saw what looked like someone walking by my window, so I got up to look and saw nothing. No cars, no one outside at our neighbors, so I made sure the door was locked and I went back to watching my show. At this point, it's probably been 20 to 30 minutes because the episode had finished, so before playing the next one, I went to the kitchen to refill my cup. Of course, we gotta have sweets in the house, so as my eyes met the chocolate chunk cookies, I went to open them when I heard a thumping sound coming from the green room. I just paused at first making sure what I heard was real. When I heard what sounded like the door sliding closed. So... I grab a steak knife, it was the closest thing to me, and I slowly walked to the back. As I got back there, I noticed the door was, in fact, slightly open still. We don't always lock the back slider because there's no reason for anyone to be back there besides us. So now, 
I'm looking around to see if someone is in here or did they leave already. Mind you, the lights are still off. So there's a light coming in from the neighbor's patio light, but that's literally it. I'm walking as close to the back wall as I could while looking around the room when I noticed someone very poorly hidden in our curtains. As I mentioned, they are pretty thick, which makes them stick out some, but they don't go all the way to the floor. So if you're trying to hide behind them, you better hope you can levitate or else your sneakers are going to show. So with that, I mustered all the bravery in me and as deep and threatening as I could, I said, You got 10 seconds to run out the door you came in, and if you make it, I won't call the cops. I don't even think I got it all out before the guy darted out from behind the curtain and then took off out the door. I'd be lying if I said that I was totally calm and prepared if he ran towards me instead. I did take notice of what he looked like though. It was dark, but the light by the door coming in was enough for me to tell that he had long dark hair pulled back in a hair tie and he was wearing a dark hoodie with some kind of logo on the left arm that looked like a circle. He also wasn't wearing anything to cover his face, so I could tell that he had a short beard. After a few seconds, I ran to the door. I locked it and looked around to see if he was anywhere nearby, but he must have taken off because he was nowhere to be seen. I did a quick look over of the room to see if he did take anything, but nothing looked like it had been touched except the pen holder that was on the floor. I assume that that was probably the thump that I heard earlier. I don't think he had the time to even consider taking anything yet. I closed all the curtains in there in the living room. I checked any windows just to make sure they were closed and locked, and then I went to check on my wife, who, based on her snoring, had been out the whole time. I ended up going back to the living room because I was too freaked out and I was wired at this point to sleep. I ended up passing out a few hours later though. I never told my wife because I didn't want her to worry about it unless something came up again. I didn't want to add any stress to her. I told her that I must have passed out while watching TV though and she believed it. From then on, I was more cautious of making sure all doors and windows are locked at night or when we leave. The following week, we went to the market one last time before she was going to the hospital. And while she was looking at the tomatoes and talking to the couple that sells them, I kept moving down to look at everything else. I came across a small table with lemonade set up and a little girl sitting at it. On the other side of the lemonade container was a crate of strawberries for sale. The girl looked really excited that I had stopped and offered some lemonade, for a price of course. I think it was like a quarter. I agreed, and the girl turned and yelled daddy to the man that was doing something behind her. He stood up and started approaching the table when my stomach dropped. This guy had long dark hair pulled back and he was wearing a hoodie with the same logo that I noticed in my house a week ago. It was for a local community college by us. He had shaved recently though. The girl told her father that I wanted a lemonade so he helped her begin pouring it. I asked how long they've been set up here and I think that's when he recognized me too. The guy's voice began to crack and he was shaking. He said he was trying to make some money since his wife was pregnant with her second girl and the people agreed to let him sit up there. He had strawberries that he was selling and bought some lemons to make lemonade with them to entice people to buy them. He said that they were down on their luck with her not working 
and him losing his job recently. He also said that you felt like he was given a second chance to do the right thing. My wife walked up about this time and I mentioned that we were about to have our first one too and he congratulated me. I ended up buying a pound of strawberries and gave the kid a five for the lemonade and her eyes just lit up. The guy actually shook my hand and thanked me and then we left. And that's the story of how I paid a guy that broke into my own home. I do hope what he said was true though and that I was the first and the last place that he broke into. My camping story comes from a time when I was actually still a child, probably around 12 years old at the absolute oldest. Back when I was young, my dad wanted me to get into hunting. He was a hunter, his dad was a hunter, and so on. Me, I never really had the drive to kill an animal, even for food. And while I understand that he was trying to instill a sense of survivalism in me, and trying to teach me what I would have to do if society collapsed. I am now 47, and society has yet to collapse. At this point, if it did, I'd probably just accept it and live off cans of spam for a few months before I succumb to the elements. Well, those were completely irrelevant to the story. My apologies. Anyways... This story took place on a hunting trip that my dad had set up for myself and him during the summer break of that year. He had planned to take me out to a hunting ground that he used to hunt on and that his friend owned. The plan was that we would sit up there and find the hunting tower and just wait for the deer to come along and then shoot them. Pretty much the standard hunting trip really. We got all of our gear together and we headed out early in the morning to get to the spot where he and I would be setting up the tents. I packed more than I needed, mostly because I was the kind of kid that would throw a fit about having to wear the same pants for days in a row, and we were supposed to be out for the whole weekend. After luggaging everything into the truck, double-checking to make sure that we had our tents and all our camping equipment, I got in the car, and to be completely honest with you, I fell asleep as soon as the tires hit the asphalt. I knew he drove for an hour or two, and then I woke up to the feeling of the truck going off the road and onto the gravel or dirt paths. He pulled up to the spot where we were supposed to be at, and he asked if I was excited. I told him that I was, and despite the fact that I was barely cognizant. We grabbed our tents and all of our gear and whatnot, then I asked him where we were supposed to set up our tents. Well, much to my dismay, he tells me that we have to hike about 10 minutes to get close to the lookout tower. I remember the look on his face when I stared daggers at him. He laughed his ass off, and then we started our trek into the woods. After about 10 minutes or so, he pointed to where the tower was and told me that that was where we would be the next morning when we actually started hunting. Then he told me to set up the tents. Yes, plural. I asked what he was going to be doing, and he said that he was going to scout the area and see what was around. Then he dropped his tent and told me that he would be back in a little bit. At first... I was pissed that he was making me do all the work, but I went to it. I set up his tent first to be nice, and then I started struggling with mine. After having a difficult time with it and saying words that my dad would have swatted me for, I finally got them both set up and got over gear in their respective tents. After that, I actually got in mine and went back to sleep. I wasn't asleep that long, probably 15 minutes or so, and I was woken up by my dad shouting my name close by. 
I quietly responded saying, Yeah, Dad, I'm in my tent. And then put my head back down. Then I was shaken awake by my dad opening my tent and telling me that I needed to get up now. I asked what was going on, thinking at first that he was just messing with me. But the look on his face quickly told me that he wasn't joking. I got up and I exited my tent and he told me that we needed to leave immediately. I told him that we just got here and asked why we needed to go. And he told me to come with him to the truck so we could leave. I asked about our camping gear and he basically told me to shut up and do what he told me to do. Being 12, I wasn't going to argue with him any more than I had. So at this point, my dad had dragged me away from the campground, left all of our gear out there, and was in a hurry to leave. So the only thing I could think to do was ask what was wrong. He didn't respond at first, but when I asked again, he once again told me to stop asking questions, and then he just kept driving. Obviously, I was annoyed, but I just sat there and stared out the window and pouted. I got even more confused when he pulled into a police station and then told me to stay in the car. I was going to ask why, but he was quick to get up and run up to the station before I could. I just continued to sit there and stare at nothing in particular. Then after about 10 minutes, he ran back out and we got back on the road. But this time, a cop cruiser was following us. And before I could ask anything, he literally told me to keep my mouth shut and not ask any more questions at all. He pulled back up to the spot where our gear was and told me to stay put. Then, he and the officers started off in the forest. Again, I was 12, and it was the late 80s, and I was not about to just sit there and do nothing bored out of my mind. Honestly, I kind of wish I had. I waited for a few minutes, and then followed behind my dad and the officer, just far enough that I knew where they were, but was distant enough to have them probably not notice me. I followed them for a bit, and then they stopped, and my dad and the officer were standing by a broken fence line. Basically, it looked like someone had knocked down the post to a barbed wire fence, and it hadn't been replaced yet. I just stood there, and I heard my dad explaining things to the officer. He told them that we were there to hunt over the weekend, that he knew the owner of the land, and that he was just walking the perimeter to check things out. Then he said that he noticed the damaged fence and went to check it out. Then he said, I came over to check the damage so I could let him know, but that's when I saw her. I may have been young, but I was able to put two and two together, him freaking out, Wanting to leave, getting the police, and that's exactly what you're thinking it was. Apparently, when he went ahead and checked out the area, he saw a woman's body lying in the brush. I later found out that it was actually a girl that was around 16 that had gone missing only a couple of days before, and the cops had determined that her body was likely to have been dumped by whoever had taken her life. So this was literally my one and only hunting trip and the only time that I ever went camping. And I can technically say that I did go camping because I slept in the tent for a little while and that means that it was camping. But jokes aside, this is the only time that my dad took me out for one of these trips. I don't think that he even got together with his buddies to hunt after this. Apparently, there is something about finding a dead body in the woods that ruins camping for you, no matter how long you've been doing it.
My friends and I often went camping in the summer in a remote place in Kentucky. It was a small, unknown area that you could easily miss, especially if you were not looking for it. This was great for us because that meant there was never anyone around to bother us and throw off our fun. Sometimes, we would invite a new person or our partners to join us, but that was it. It was supposed to be for new homes, but after cutting down some of the trees, they ended up leaving the area untouched and never put in any houses. Including myself and my girlfriend Robin, there were going to be six people there for this weekend. I wanted some time alone with Robin, so we decided that we would stay an extra day or two after they left. Once we got there and got all settled, everyone started drinking and being stupid. It was a great time, but Robin wasn't one for the great outdoors. She wanted to join and be with me, which was really sweet, but she couldn't stand the bugs. She didn't like the idea of sleeping in a tent on just blankets, and she definitely didn't like there were no restrooms nearby. But she was a trooper. She tried her best to have a good time, and I think she did once she started getting a little buzzed. The first night was great, other than Robin waking up to every sound and movement. The next day was fine as well, just sitting around, drinking, and just hanging out. It's nice not to have any expectations, or errands to run, and just being able to kick back, eat, and sleep at your leisure. However, later that evening, while we were all talking and having a good time, Robin started looking around and staring hard into the darkness. After her doing this a few times, I asked her what was going on, and she said she felt like someone was watching us. I brushed it off at first, thinking it was just her starting to get paranoid with it getting darker. She shrugged it off at first too, but then I started seeing her go right back to it. I asked her again if there was something that she actually saw, and she again said no, but just felt uneasy. I suggested maybe we should head to bed early, thinking maybe it would help to which she didn't hesitate, and then we headed off to our tent. We lay there, and I started drifting as she was reading a book. I'm not sure how long I was out, but at one point, she started shaking my arm trying to wake me up. When I tried to ask her what, she put a finger to her mouth, telling me to be quiet and listen. I sat there quietly, hearing only my friend's radio at first. When I mentioned this, Robin said, The footsteps. So I again listened, when I finally started hearing what sounded like slow and patterned footsteps. I tried telling her that it was probably one of the others, just walking around drunk or trying to go to the bathroom. So to calm her down and ease her tension, I made a comment out loud to the effect of, Don't be going over here by our tent! And smirked, looking at Robin. She didn't find it very funny, and neither did the person by our tent by the sound of the groan that I heard. And before I could respond though, one of my friends hollered back asking what I was talking about. I asked who was by my tent, and they said that they were the only other ones awake. Seeing Robin's freaked out face, I got out of the tent to see who was messing with us. That's when I confirmed that my friend was right. He started getting out of his tent too, and we both looked over behind my tent. And to my shock, it was an older guy. He had long matted hair that looked like it hadn't been brushed in years. His face was covered in what looked like dirt and also scabs. He was wearing boxers, a t-shirt, and slippers. Again, 
This was a remote area, and there aren't any businesses or homes nearby, so I have no idea where this guy came from. Not knowing what to do, I just looked at him and said, Um, hello? The man would not make direct eye contact. He always looked around me or at the ground. He also never responded. So instead, I asked, How did you get here? And by now, Robin came out of the tent and gasped at the sight of this man. This time, he did respond, but not in English. Unfortunately, I did not know any other language, but I can at least tell if it was Spanish or French, and it was neither of those. I asked if he knew English, and again, he just mumbled something in a different language. Robin then asked him if he needed help, and she offered to call 911. But when she said this, he kept shaking his head and saying, No, no, no! Over and over, as he started walking away and holding his side. Robin tried shouting out to him, but he kept saying no and something else and walked away into the night. I thought it was definitely bizarre and had no idea how this man, in his condition, had even got there. She said we should probably call someone in case that he got out somewhere and had something wrong with him. My friend didn't like this idea since we could get in trouble for trespassing. We had all been drinking, so there was no way that we were safe to even drive. So I calmed Robin down and told her that we will just leave with them tomorrow instead of staying longer, and that we would just call the police on our way out so they can come and look for him, to which she agreed. The next morning, we got up, had a little breakfast, and started packing to head home. The rest of the group was taking a bit longer to leave, but Robin was so anxious to see if she could find this guy before we left. So we started driving around to see if we could find him, but no luck. The area wasn't that big, but we still didn't see him. Thinking he probably wandered off somewhere else, Robin was upset, but she understood that there wasn't anything else that we could do. So, we headed back over to our friends and helped as the last of them left. Nothing really came out of the situation until a few days later. Robin had come over to my place and immediately pulled up a news article. It was about a body that was found close to where we were camping. It was an older guy in his 60s that had been stabbed and bled out. I don't remember the name anymore, but what I do remember was that he was Swedish. Then, they also showed a picture of the victim. It was the same guy that we saw while we were camping, but just in better health. That also explained the different language that he was speaking. It was pretty heartbreaking. This guy was standing right in front of us, probably holding his side from the stabbing, and he didn't want us to call the police. But why? And to top it all off, the suspect was the wanted. Was the killer nearby? Did he walk by like this guy did while we were asleep? Robin ended up going to the police and talking to them. I couldn't blame her. She has too kind of a heart, which made it even worse on her, knowing that we didn't do anything. I don't know if they ever caught the suspect, but I sure hope so. For everyone's safety, and so that man can be at peace. As a child, I was really close to my father. I went everywhere with him, including camping, fishing, and hunting. He taught me how to set up a tent, how to prepare a fish to eat, and tried his best to teach me hunting tips. I enjoyed going with him, 
but it was hard for me to shoot them, and even harder to prepare them. I typically cried, but I tried not to show it. My dad, though, bless him, never pressured me to do it, and never teased me or made fun of me for it. He would end up doing that part when I wasn't around or sleeping or something. He even taught me some botany. I knew what plants in our area to avoid and which ones were safe to eat and so forth. I bring this up because he, of course, was the one that made me fall in love with camping and the great outdoors. So when he died, teenager me took it very hard. I was never that close to my mother, at least not nearly as close as I was with my dad. She hated that I never wanted to do the normal girly things with her. I'd rather go fishing in the rain than go to prom in a limo. So when she tried to push more of those type of things on me, it only drove us further apart. When my father passed, I became a recluse for the longest time. I still had a year before I graduated, so I had to deal with my mother's wishes and demands till then. I did some of the things she wanted me to, to keep her happy, hoping that I could use it for a future request. And just that happened. A couple of my friends from school were talking about going on a camping trip when school was out, so with my grades going back up and keeping up with the chores, I asked my mom to go. At first, she was hesitant, but finally agreed to let me go. I was ecstatic and I hadn't been this happy in so long. I started packing everything up to go and waited for my friend to pick me up. When they arrived, I threw my stuff in the back of the truck and I hopped in before my mom could come out and then change her mind. And we were off. This was actually at a state park, so there were no designated camping grounds or spots. So you just had to find a place that you wanted to stay and set up. When we got there, my friends found a place that was surrounded by nothing but trees. It was beautiful. I had never been here, so I was in awe of how tall these trees were. So we set up a couple of tents that we had, and then started our fire pit, when one of my friends pulled out the alcohol and green. Yes, I know we shouldn't have, but I for one didn't realize that they had brought it, and I had also been in a dark place since my father died, so I made some bad choices that day. But overall, it was a great night and a much-needed getaway. We enjoyed ourselves that night, and I actually ended up passing out on a blanket by the fire. The next morning, I ended up waking up before everyone else, but I didn't want to wait around. I knew they were going to be out for a while, so I left them a note. I grabbed my bag with the gear that I had, and then I headed off on my own. I grabbed a pamphlet on our way here and saw that hunting and fishing was permitted. So, I thought that I would walk around to see if they had a shop where you could buy or rent a pool. Well, no luck finding a place, but I did get to the beautiful lake and got to watch another kid learn to fish for a bit. It was getting too depressing for me though, so I just decided to keep moving. I saw a tree on the other side of the lake, though that stood a bit taller than the rest and was slightly darker. Something told me that I needed to go over here, so that's where I headed. As I get closer, I noticed there was a placard in front of the tree that explained what type it was, and also how it got there and etc. But what caught my attention was the border behind it. A few feet behind the tree lines was a small cheap fence separating us from what appeared to be a field that had a lot of dead plants, debris, and the sort, as well as a sign warning of bears. Of course, curiosity got the best of me, and while no one was looking, I tossed my bag, then jumped over the fence. 
I cautiously made my way through the forbidden land while watching to make sure that no one spotted me. I finally got far enough away that I couldn't make out any people or the starting line, so I started exploring. Along the way, I was stopped by a horrible smell. Hunting with my dad so many times, I knew exactly what it was too. And no surprise though, as it is a forest. Wildlife is bound to die or become prey, so I just continued on my way. The smell, however, was getting stronger, so I assumed that I was probably approaching it. I wasn't ready to turn back yet, so I just hoped that I didn't end up disturbing something in the process. The good news was that nothing was there to put me in danger, but the bad news was that I found the source of the smell. It looked like it was a coyote. I know this may be too much for some, but it looked like it had been cut open, like it was being cleaned or prepped by a hunter. The problem was, it hadn't been touched, other than the cut on its abdomen. Who would hunt a coyote of all animals, and who would just leave it like this? I thought it was weird, but I just carried along the way. After several feet and the smell starting to dissipate, I lightened up a bit and I continued to explore. Not long after though, I came across a bunch of tree branches and rotten broken logs. I started looking through it to see if there was anything of interest in the pieces. When I noticed something of it was wet, I thought it was just sap or water maybe, until I got closer and wiped a piece along the ground with my shoe. It was blood, and as mentioned, it was still wet like it was fresh. This kind of put me on edge after seeing the coyote earlier. I had no idea what this was from or what caused it, but stupid me still wanted to continue on. Further along, I ended up smelling decay again, but this time, it was much worse. I ended up pulling my button up over my nose to try and mask the smell. And with what I had already seen, I was determined to find out what was causing this. There was a small ditch that I had to pass over, and on the other side, the grass was even taller. I was about 5 foot 5 at that time, and it went up to about my knees. As I started going over the ditch, I noticed another dead animal in the water. It again looked like a small coyote or a fox. This one was harder to tell by the condition it was in, so I quickly jumped over and walked along the side of the ditch. A few feet away, there was an opening in the grass like someone else had walked through it. What better time to pass through it, right? I could see in the distance, though, what looked like a very old tent, so I thought that I'd make my way toward it, cautiously. Along the way, I started to spot blood again. This time, it looked like a trail, like something was being dragged, and as I got closer to the tent, the smell almost became unbearable. I pulled myself together and made the final steps to this tent. However... It was not a tent. It looked like a tarp that was thrown over a low-hanging branch. I don't know if that was done on purpose or if someone was staying in it, but that was the least of my fears. In front of this tent was another tarp spread out on the ground, being held down by four or five carcasses of coyotes, foxes, and a wild hog. These, however, were not looking like they were hunted, in the sense to take home. They were mutilated. There was also one that had been, well, attached to a tree. Its head was missing, hanging upside down, and even worse, it looked like it was done with some kind of spear. But the part that astounded me even more was how high up it was. The spear was out of my reach. How tall was this person that did this? And why would they do this? And 
Was it even a person? With a combination of alcohol, the heat, and the fear, I ended up getting sick, and I quickly tried to get out of there. I didn't want whatever it was out there to find me. I did find my way back by a close route. That way, I didn't have to see or smell any of that again. But when I approached the tree line near a different part of the lake, I noticed that it had been cut, pushed down, and then attempted to be put back up. Someone or something has obviously been back there as well, as in the actual park, which terrified me even more. What the hell kind of thing is out there with us and doing those kinds of things back there? I regretfully didn't tell anyone though. Hell, I didn't even know if it could have been someone that worked here. And I wasn't supposed to be back there anyways, so I couldn't even think about what I could say. I could finally breathe easy being around large groups of people, and I started walking back to my friends to try and have a good rest of our trip. I can tell you one thing though. It wasn't easy, and I still haven't forgotten about it. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember... Your fear feeds me.